This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Boz Digital Labs, and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. With voiceover, the standards are really, really high that it has to be super quiet, super low noise floor, little to no reflections. Like they just don't want reflections. The environments that I record VO in that I always have is is I started in my sliding door closet with moving blankets, not a walk-in, a sliding door that's like 2.8 feet wide and a little bassy, a little, you know, boxy sounding, but it got the job done. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio mac the speed to create the capacity to dream now find out how awesome your studio can be at owc this episode is sponsored by boz digital labs offering you the coolest plugins for your mixes like the hoser xt and plus 10 db signature series you can transform your drums with sasquatch kick machine or transgressor get massive bass with big clipper or add width and depth using mongoose and imperial delay all boz digital labs plugins are available as fully functioning no time limit free trials so you can check them out on your mixes right now just go to bozdigitallabs.com or click the link in the show notes of this episode This episode is sponsored by Jay-Z Microphones with the unique Golden Drop capsule design. The Black Hole Series BH1S and BH2 microphones with the hole in the middle for a -a one-of-a-kind shock mount combine innovative industrial design with careful craftsmanship to bring a world-class sound to your studio, resulting in a level of quality and detail in your recordings that you won't find in other mics. Go to jayzmic.com or click the link in the show notes below and use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR right now to get an incredible 50% off. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Jordan Reynolds, an established voice actor and in-demand progressive voiceover demo reel and audio producer in Los Angeles. His voice has been heard all over the world, voicing internationally known companies such as Lego, Audi, Sprite, and Cisco, to voice dubbing and impersonating celebrities, to screaming in video games such as World of Warcraft, to voicing villains in Netflix anime series. He directs and records voice talent both in his professional home studio or from their home studio online. When he then mixes and produces personalized demo reels with music and sound effects. He's a frequent speaker on the topic of demos, audio, and voiceover at some of the largest voiceover conferences in the industry. And he has also played a key role in designing the very first high quality microphone made specifically for voiceover, and that is the Roswell Pro Audio RAVO. And Rockstars, you may remember that I have a lot of wonderful things to say about Roswell Pro Audio, who have been a wonderful sponsor on the podcast in the past as well. So this is a slight detour from our usual talk of making records, um, music records in the studio, but I find that there's a ton to learn from recording voice in the studio as well. And in fact, I have paid many a bill to keep my studio afloat in the past by learning to record voice as well as spoken word, voiceover, and podcasting. So please welcome Jordan Reynolds to Recording Studio Rockstars. Jordan, are you ready to rock, dude? Let's rock! Nicely done. (laughs) (laughs) You knew that was coming, right? (laughs) Um, Let's do it! So first question, man, how many rock stars have you you had to uh, do the voice of in your career? (laughs) 
<laughs> what do you mean? Like how many times have I had the opportunity to do that stupid voice? Any, yeah, any of them, anything that sounds like somebody who's in a rock band or have you actually impersonated real <laughs> musicians in their voices? You know, I've definitely auditioned to, to voice match some musician celebrities. I can't think of any that come to mind. Maybe. How about John Lennon and Paul McCartney? Can you do those? Yeah. We'll see. Uh, well, Paul McCartney, uh, He's, everything's kind of up here. I have to kind of channel into it. Uh, but yeah, John Lennon, he's a lot easier. Uh, you see, he's a, 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 where are they from? I'm from Liverpool. Liverpool. But everything just kind of yeah, goes around here. You know, I, I made lots of records and uh, I'm very, very popular in the rock uh, music genre. That's a pretty bad John Lennon. But, sorry, uh, but it was really an unfair, you know, it's like, I, I had no that, idea this was coming, Lidge. Exactly. So. Impersonating somebody is all about matching. And we're going to talk about that too. <laughs> matching a voice. And it's not fair for me to just throw one out at you without having the reference, right? <laughs> Actually, it's like mixing records. You need a reference track if you really want to do a killer mix. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, well give us an introduction to who you are. I mean, uh, again, um, I preface this by saying that we're, this is a, a little bit of a departure from music, but I, I find recording voices fascinating. And it's um, I'm intrigued by the challenges of just creating a great recording and I mean, the, yeah. without the voice, I and mean, we don't have much for music to listen to unless we're just doing instrumental jazz. <laughs> or some super avant-garde stuff, right? Right. Um, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, just to, to give a basic timeline, uh, you know, I come from a, a big family, six kids, and pretty much everyone is creative or musical in some way or another. Um, and... I was just surrounded by it. You know, my mom was a piano teacher, still is to this day, and she's in her 60s, and she still has a, a little a, a side business of teaching piano to kids. Right on. Um, so it was just, I was always surrounded by it growing up. And uh, I never got proficient at any instruments in particular. I was, I was into, the, I had electric guitar phase, you know, super into metal, went to tons of like hardcore metal shows in the early 2000s, late nice. 90s. Right? Yeah. That was like, can you, I'm sure you don't have to do it now, but I'm sure you can do the high note, right? I don't, man, um, sure I can do. I you know what now I think about. I did play a, a over the top rock star auditioning on a fake American Idol lottery radio commercial. That was a mouthful. Wow! So it, they were they were like doing a parody of American Idol for a lotto spot, and then I booked. Apparently, I was the only one who just went for it in my audition, where I just like yeah. You know, just like nice. totally <laughs> over the top, just being an idiot. And they're like, we loved how you just went for it. And that's what you got to do, right? Just give it your all. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, the, the, a lot of the metal I was listening to actually was a lot more of just straight up scream, like, you know, like death metal growls and grunts. And oh, yeah. So it's not really note based it's more just which i cannot do, you do. like this music yes yeah the, the cookie monster vocals right <laughs> i can't do I, there's two voices i can't do um without risk of of coughing fits and that's cookie monster voice or a bear <laughs> voice if i try and impersonate a bear well, said, well i gotta hear what your bear interpretation i, I mean is. i Go won't be it. able to finish the interview well i'll just be coughing <laughs> oh, for, for the next three hours <laughs> <laughs> all right well, yeah, you, then you Oh, I missed it. I, was, it I can't. I can't. Uh, <laughs> the teaser. All right, you got to do it at the end. Then you got to you got to slate us out of the the show with. with All right, the bear remind voice. me. I'll close it. out on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was just surrounded by musical, uh, my whole musical family, and I I just was really into it. Um, again, didn't get like super good at anything. Uh, mostly due to the distraction of the computer and video games on the computer. So that was pretty much my life. I was a nerd. Um, did really bad in school. Stayed up way too late gaming, right? Mm -hmm. um, gaming was my life. Just first-person shooters, you know, Counter-Strike to be specific. Um, and so I was really a nerd at heart, but also super into music and film scores. Like I'm a Danny Elfman freak. Um, so that's kind of the, the influence came from there, right? And... Um, so once I, you know, became an adult and I had to like, you know, pay for my own bills and live on my own, <laughs> the, the hard, the hard knock life. Right. Um, I mm -hmm. was told like once my voice had fully developed people, I just kept getting, you know, compliments and people were like, oh, you have such a nice voice. You should, you should, uh, maybe get into radio or something. I'm like, yeah, maybe, 
cool. Uh, maybe I should. <laughs> right? Like, I didn't even notice. Wow. You know, it's like that. That's how my that's what my ego would do. Right. I'm like, you yeah, know, that's probably all it takes. Right. It's a nice voice. Um, and so I've I eventually just jumped the gun. I'm like, all right, what does it take? You know, to do this whole voiceover thing and like, whoa, you can make money at people. What they pay all their bills just talking into a mic. What? Yeah. Um, yeah, you but, get paid for saying shit. Yeah, that's all it is, right? It's piece of cake. Oh, what? <laughs> all all I'm missing is the home studio setup. I can figure that out. So, um, so yeah, I had no experience with uh, any recording anything. Like, I think I recorded a song for my uh, uh, girlfriend in high school on my gaming headset microphone. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> like, I, I wrote a cheesy song to ask her to prom that I put on a mix CD for her, and uh, that was my extent of recording actual music like and then, and then i use that same mic and put it up next to my little ibanez guitar amp <laughs> now is this and, a girl that you met in person or one that you met only in online gaming that turned right. out to be a middle-aged dude or something <laughs> that's, that's a legit no i wasn't on catfish thank god that would have been a, <laughs> that would have been i about to have some serious ptsd from that no <laughs> i've never even heard of catfish but i get it already i, I think i it. think that's the name of the show or at least the term is called catfishing where you totally fake who you are and then oh, once man. you it, it, it's an mtv show i don't know if it's still running but it was pretty popular for a while <laughs> but no no we the, we were high we were in high school uh i had seen her face she she appeared to be womanly to me um <laughs> well so said. So yeah, I, I was I was into her. <laughs> so so all right. So you're doing a little music, doing a little singing. Um, you get into the voice thing. And did you start out in radio? Did you like go work in a radio station first, or did you go straight into kind of recording your voice for voiceover stuff? No, it's a great question because a lot of people who do voiceover full time nowadays they started in um in radio, which is a great path for. A number of reasons, mostly on the technical side, right? You figure out how to use mixer boards and how to edit your own audio and how to not mess up your takes because you're live on the air. I mean, there's all these benefits to it. But um, I was on, I was, I entered the voiceover scene at a very particular, like, it was when the trends were like, radio's not as fun or cool as it once was, or it's, it's not all it's made out to be. That's, that was getting more of that from people who I knew either had a fresh background just out of radio or who were still in radio. And, um, right. At this this point, nobody sends you a bag of cocaine to play their new single (laughs) anymore. Right. No, it's just not what it used to be. (laughs) I know, man. It's like all they send is like, you know, Capri Suns they are cheap. So (laughs) I, I I needed that cocaine. So, uh, so I, you know, I, I went the hardcore rock star voiceover route, uh, where you're recording your basement alone all the time. Uh, but so no, I, I didn't go that route because people, honestly, people were just like, dude, it's the pay is shit. You, you, you're always afraid of losing your job. You're just a number to them. Um, you know, it's just horrible stories. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to keep my, my IT career going. Cause at this point in my twenties, I was, it was just, um, com, you know, IT computer tech stuff mm-hmm. I was doing it, just working in a cubicle or in an office. Um, and I actually really liked it. Um, I really liked the job, most of the jobs I had, uh, in, in, in the tech field and it, but something just was, I was like, you know, I don't know if I really want to do this my whole life. Right. Yeah. Um, there's, it's just not, it's not feeding that creative side that I have really kind of bottled up a lot, mostly cause I was just into the nerdier thinky side of things like gaming and, you know, computer tech stuff. So anyways, uh, I, I look into it and like, oh, you need a home studio and I figure out what are the what's recommended for home studios. And this was around 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. And as I tend to do, I usually go a little overboard. You know, I I don't want to just half ass it. It's just not my nature. Right. (laughs) Um, So what that also what happens there is you just you you overthink it, you over plan. Right. And so but I I started with like, what was it the Mackie Onyx? Oh, right. Yeah. It was that the so little mixer, called? Mackie mixer with the digital or something like that. Yeah. And it was Firewire 400. And um, you could like pop it out of like, it had this big, giant, heavy base. It's tilted at an angle, but you could take out the middle part, which was more of the size of like a Focusrite 2i2. Hmm. <laughs> which I never oh, right, needed right. that. But that was like, that was what I bought um, an AT2020, an Audio Technica, which I is usually my talkback mic. It's actually sitting on my desk right now. I wanted to use a better mic for today's recording. <laughs> what are you What are you using right now? Uh, Sennheiser four sixteen shotgun mic. Really, it's a shotgun mic. Wow. Yeah, 
Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm excited to talk about mics. And of course, we'll talk about the Roswell here in a moment too. But um, I didn't know that, I, I just guess I didn't really even realize that a shotgun mic was a good choice for voice. So I'm excited to learn all this stuff. Well, that, yeah, there's a whole story with that, but it would ha- because shotguns weren't supposed to be, and it was kind of a happy accident that happened in voiceover history. And it's become a big, big standard, but well, but yeah, I think anyways, of an RE twenty too, which is which is kind of shotgun looking, right? Yeah, yeah. but definitely more popular in radio, right? And they have it has a different sonic signature. They're a lot more. Um, they just got more of a punchy in your face sound, which mm-hmm. is great for radio and like podcasting and even interviews and stuff. Um, especially when you need to reject noise, that's most important. But when it comes to commercials or dialogue or character stuff or trailer, you know, all these different genres of voiceover, they, most of them prefer a more natural open sound, which is why condenser mics are highly more used for voiceover than dynamic. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I mean, I guess I've discovered a few things myself trying to do this. So for example, I've done voiceover or spoken word where I go record kids in schools and it's a terrible environment. Um, and I tried the very first one I did, um, I, I had a couple of interns with me too. And we like took all this complicated stuff with us. And I, I swear, I, I kid you not, I brought my Neumann U67 vintage microphone <laughs> to a high school and oh set my it up. God. And it was, the, it was terrible sounding. It was just such a mess. And like, it was sounded, you heard so much crap in the background and like, you couldn't get the right mid range out of it and stuff. It was really funny. And now I've learned, I just take like, um, I have a Mic Tech PM9, which is a dynamic mic, kind of an SM58 uh, style. And I'll just record that straight in. And then it's all about the plugins later. That's how I get it yep. all quiet and everything. Yep. But um, awesome. So <laughs> so shotgun mic is a cool choice. Yeah, just keep going, man. There's so many questions. I don't want to interrupt, but I'll probably have a million questions as we go, you know? Oh, no, you're, no, I'm, no, you're fine, man. Um yeah, I get, let me just wrap up, I guess, how I got to, you know, doing it, this, the voice and more of what you guys would be interested, your audience would be interested in, which is the tech side of things in the voiceover genre. Yeah. Um, but yeah, essentially with the, I, I, I picked up the, the audio side of things real quick because I was already, you know, I was already very nerdy and tech minded. Right. So, and I had, I knew I had a good ear from, you know, it was just coming from a musical family. So it's not like I, knew how to use everything, right? But, you know, figuring out editing, and voiceover is a lot more simple than music, right? So uh, it's, you know, it's mono, it's one track, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, There's not a lot of moving parts compared to recording a drum kit, for example. Um, So I I got really into that and super hardcore in the tech side and audio side. And I was recording, you know, family uh, songs, you know, doing a Christmas album, you know, like, because I had a, a MIDI keyboard that I would have my sister come over and play. And we, so I was doing a lot of like hobby music recording too, but I wasn't really doing much with my voice. Like I wasn't training, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? I was just kind of reading and absorbing and reading and reading and reading and absorbing, but not really practicing or applying it. And so we know all about that. Yeah. Uh, all of right. us aspiring mixers watching YouTube videos know exactly what that feels like. Exactly. Dude, you could just watch all day and it feels good. It feels like you're doing something productive and it is on some level, but, um, I think I can't remember who I was listening to, but, um, the guy in your last episode, the, the Aussie. <laughs> oh yeah. Name. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe it was Pete Johns. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was it. He was saying something along the similar lines of, I found myself doing like 95% like absorbing research. Yeah. And fi- yeah, research and 5% actually doing. And that's the position I was in when it comes, when it came to trying to make a living at voiceover work. So, um, but it was also because I spent a lot of time on the tech side, figuring out all that stuff and way more than I needed to, to do just record auditions and basic projects for voiceover. I recorded, or I figured out, you know, a lot more about compression and reverbs and EQ and gates, like just stuff you don't really need to know much about, but I went overboard there. Mm -hmm. And what that eventually did though, is that put me down uh, a path of just getting, wanting to get involved socially online. And so I fell in love with the home recording show podcast with John Tidy. Oh yeah. Ryan John's Castro. Great, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was, a, you know, avid listener of that always listened as I drove back and forth from my day job. 
And I interacted with um, them and Randy Coppinger and Matt McGlynn from Recording Hacks, you know, Roswell. <laughs> yep, yep. And so uh, I didn't mention it already, but Rockstar's Matt has also been a guest on the podcast and gave a, a fantastic um, interview. Uh, and that's episode 116. So RSR 116. If you awesome. want to check out his interview, he talks about building a mic locker and helps you understand all the different microphones. Ah, oh, that's so, I, I totally need to listen to that because I need more mics in my life. <laughs> not, <laughs> Why not? <laughs> um, How many do you yeah, have, man? We, we, we got to know. Shit. What does a voiceover talent have for a mic locker? Well, okay. See, I'm not a normal voice talent. Like I'm, you know, I do the production side of things and I'm a freak. So I know I don't have as many as some other voice talent, but I don't have an official count. I've got to think for a minute, but let me kind of spin around and point. So you got, and, and this is combining my, my, uh, my girlfriend, she's a full-time talent. She lives with me. She has her other, her own studio on the other side of the house. So I'm counting her mic set. We all share. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. I'm going to estimate close to 20. Wow. Nice. 20, uh, 20 mics for your voice. I love it. Well, well, no, cause I actually, I, I would buy, I bought some back in the day for doing music and, and, and stuff like that. Like I have an SM58, an SM57. Um, uh, I've got like, I've got a pencil, like a Lewitt LCT 140 for, you know, acoustic guitars. I have mm -hmm. two blue mics. Um, nice. yeah. So it's honestly, it's just been for different flavors more so for, for the music side of things, but then uh, definitely for voiceover too. Yeah. You know? I know that when you're singing music in the studio, um, the first time you have an opportunity to, to kind of do a shootout on somebody's voice and, and pick the mic for the record that you maybe didn't expect you were going to want to use. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty eye opening. You know, do you, do you find that that happens to you in the voiceover world too, where you're like, man, I didn't realize that, you know, this particular mic was going to sound so great in my voice for this one use. No, yes, absolutely. Um, there, there are some mics that are kind of staples in this business, like the the Neumann TLM 103, the Sennheiser 416 that I'm talking on. And while they sound good, it's like a good, you know, go to mic, but it sounds terrible on some people's voices. Um, sometimes it's just because of the nature of their voice, or it's the room that they're recording in. It might be a really bad booth, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, or really echoey room. Um, like for example, the, uh, like there's the Rode NTG3, right? That's a shotgun mic. It's like a, I think it's like four or 500 bucks. People, people try, people get that instead of the 416, which is closer to a thousand as kind of like a, the next, you know, second best thing, if you will, uh, from having the 416. Mm -hmm. But I find the sound, the sonic signature of that, it's got like a really bumped, like the low end is very, ooh, and the top end is very, you know, there's a lot more sibilance on it. And, um, but on some voices, it's like, ooh, it's buttery. It's yeah. perfect. Right. And you just don't know until you put it up. Um, so yeah, yeah that's my long answer to say, absolutely. You, you, that's great. you don't know until you try. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Um, okay, cool. Well, let, uh, keep, keep going. So you, you, um, I feel like I keep cutting you off with questions about this stuff. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> but no, you're in LA I'm taking now too damn long. And, and you've been uh, doing this for, for a while out there. Tell us about your studio. I mean, what did you end up creating for an environment for you to be able to do what you do? So, um, I moved to LA in almost, uh, let's see, two years ago this month. So I built my VO career and demo business in Denver. Uh, it's where I was raised, but I, uh, pretty much all, most of my demos I did there that I was producing for other talent were done remotely. 
And since I've moved here, most of them, people come into my studio, um, which is great. I always prefer that just because I, one, I have control over the audio. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but two, it's just, you just, there's nothing like having that face to face, you know, rapport. Um, so you're asking what my current setup is today. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about your studio. It's really simple, man. Um, because I, you know, I got into this more in the digital age, right? So I haven't, while I've wanted a lot of gear, I've been, I've been really good at not getting too much stuff, even though I really want it. And I rely more, I, I, I put more of my money into really good quality plugins, but, um, right, right. And then, and just, just for clarity's sake, you said that what we're interviewing you on today is not your normal VO rig. You're using something simpler. So you don't have to be in the, in the booth the entire time. Yeah. Cause that feels a little bit like work. Yeah, exactly. I, I wanted to be able to, to kind of chill and hang out, put, kick my feet up at my desk. So right now, um, I'm just sitting at my, uh, my control room desk and it's, I forget what brand it is. It's, you can get it. This thing's like sound something, but it's perfect. It's, it's got, it's got two six U racks, which I'm very under utilizing. I've just got a Furman power conditioner mm -hmm. and I have two RME Fireface UFXs. Okay. Um, and the only reason I have two is one is a backup. Like one I had for years and it started like the lights started flickering weird and like, I'm yeah. like, okay, either I'm either a UFO is, is invading or <laughs> I, or it's going out and I don't, I can't risk that dying in the middle of a very expensive session, you know? Yeah. Well, um, one of the interesting things about keeping a simple studio is it's a lot more affordable to have a duplicate backup for everything you need, just in case you need it, which you might yeah. in yep. any studio situation. And then, uh, you said the mic that you're using now is the Audio Technica or it's the Sennheiser? No, what I'm talking to in right now is the Sennheiser 416. Okay, okay. Or M MKH-416 is the exact model. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. Well, it sounds great, um, man. Yeah, no, it actually sounds, the room sounds really good out here. I've got a lot of acoustic treatment out here. So I've got like a, I've got a four inch trap hanging above me and then a six inch trap wedged on the corner and four inch traps on the corners. I'm sure you'll have pictures or you can go to my website and see pictures, but. Yeah, well, uh, we'll try and put those in the blog post as well. Um, what, what do you, like, what are some lessons you've learned about treating a room properly for voice and knowing that it's not enough or that it's too much treatment? It's a great question. See, all the voice recording I've done has been n n never at my, in, in my control room, even though I can get away with it. Like if, it, if I didn't have, cars driving by and stuff like that outside that where it was audible. Mm -hmm. I could record here if I got, you know, a bit tighter on the mic like this. You're not going to hear because you can hear a little bit of reflection in the room, but it's not too bad. Um, yeah, when you're but, when you're closer, I don't hear it. But when you're back off and doing normal, I hear just the tiniest bit. And it sounds quite nice, too. Yeah, it, right. Like right here is kind of a nice distance, right? It's more present. Um, but the reason why it's really hard to record in VO in a room is because of exterior noises, your computer fan, your, um, you know, any car driving by any lawnmower, a dog barking, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, even hard drives, like non, obviously non SSDs, but like, you know, traditional spinning disc hard drives, you hear those grinding away yeah. that gets picked up and in voiceover, it, it is like, you can get away with some noise and some stuff in music, right? No, I'm not saying it's, it, you can have low standards. I'm just saying like, it's okay if, you know, you, you hear someone shuffling their feet kind of quietly over in the corner. Yeah, because well, well it's, masking it's going into mix. Too. And it's also, well, it's audio masking. So the concept of masking yeah. says that if you have two frequencies and they're close to each other um, and one is louder than the other by a certain amount, you won't hear the other. In fact, it's what goes into the um, design of MP3 compression. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, the MP3s, the compression says... If there are certain things in there and they're quiet beyond a certain level, well, then the human ear supposedly can't hear it. So we're just going to delete them. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's coming back to me now. I remember that's, yeah, that's crazy. So, so to finish mm. that thought in music, there's a lot of information. And so therefore a lot of noise might actually be masks where you're not even hearing it, except right. for, guess what, rock stars, those breaks where you hear too much effects or where all of a sudden it's like, oh man, I hear the click track bleeding through on the vocal mic uh, for yeah. that split second. Exactly, exactly. So with voiceover, the standards are really, really high that it has to be super quiet, super low noise floor, little to no reflections. Like they just don't want reflections. Yeah. Um, and so 
the environments that I record VO in that I always have is, is I started in my sliding door closet <laughs> with moving blankets, not nice. a walk-in, a sliding door that's like 2.8 feet wide. So you go in there and you are moving your arms. You're just like, <laughs> wow. right. But that got the job done a little bassy, a little, you know, boxy sounding, but it got the job done. Then the next time I had a bigger walk-in closet that I put acoustic panels up pretty much covering every surface. Just make it super, super dead. Now, when you talk about Basie, that's one of the things that I think we sometimes forget about or just don't know about until you get there. If you put a lot of blankets and treatments on the walls, our our ear immediately recognizes, oh, it's less echoey in here. But what we're not picking up on is that it's actually doing nothing to kill the low-end modes in the room and then the space, which is why it ends up sounding Basie. It's because really all you're doing is you're just killing off all the upper frequency stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And which gives it a very unnatural sound. It's, right. it's like, it's, it feels like it's, it's uncomfortable to listen to. It's and like a lot of people, somebody sucked the air out of you or something. Yeah, exactly. And that's the problem, man, is when, you know, booths are really expensive, like prefab booths are really expensive. And, um, so, and, and the reason why I finally have invested in a booth is because I needed it to block sound from getting in. Right. I didn't buy a booth because I'm like, ooh, I just need the acoustics to sound better than my walk-in closet, which was back in Denver, by the way. I had like a really, it's like a six by seven walk-in closet with like kind of angled acoustic panels that I mounted on the wall and the ceiling and it sounded so good. <laughs> but but if someone walked upstairs or flushed a toilet or just any anything would get into the recording quite easily, right? Mm. So I eventually had to build a booth, you know, I hired a guy, drywall and all that stuff and put a lot of time and money into it. And while it was dense as hell, like it was a tank, no sound was getting in. It had this huge peak at 80 Hertz. So everything, you know, it's like everything was, I'm, I'm changing my voice to kind of make it like exaggerated, but it's like everything, no matter who it was, if there was a male voice, it sounded like this in there. It just yeah. had this woo, 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 woo. It was so bad. Um, I hired an acoustician to come over. He did a sine wave sweep. And then he gave me some recommendations and I got... um, His recommendation was to move to LA. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, right? Spend, after you just spent a lot of money on me, moved to LA. No, I had no plan to move to LA when this was being built. This was... I was going to be there for a while in Denver. Now, but now, do you mind if we ask how much, like what, what ballpark budget it takes to build a room like that? Sure. It was a five... It was pretty much like a five and a half by six foot booth with a seven foot ceiling. Like and a half bath or like yeah. a tiny half bath. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was, it was spacious. Like for a VO booth is very comfy. A lot of, a lot of VO booths that you can buy prefab at the entry level are four by three. All right. So I had like five by six. It was a, it was a pretty, it was a good space and it was double wall, um, five eighths inch drywall, uh, four layers of it wedged, you know, with, with, a, with a gap in the middle, really expensive glass at a uh, two by two foot window, man, I can't, it's been so long, but I think it was like in the rain after paying to my contractor who, who undercharged me. <laughs> right. Um, but I paid we're, him we're a lot. Usually and, looking for those, right? Yeah, no, he's such a good guy. Like, like I, he got free meals and endless IPAs like the whole time. Like and he had, not only that, an but open when, bar. You, when you told him he was doing a good job, it really sounded good. Oh, it did. No, it did. You're doing a real, I can't even pretend to be you, but. <laughs> You're doing a real good job, man. That's what I'm talking um, about right there. <laughs> but uh, I wish I could remember the exact figure, but it was still way cheaper than if I were to get that prefabbed, right? Um, it right. was something, I think it was like after labor and everything, six to eight grand, if that. Right. And the, and prefab are like these whisper quiet rooms where Correct. it's a big metal box that goes kaplunk right in the middle of your house or something. Correct. But they're portable. Unlike the one that, you know, <laughs> I, I right. built. Right. Right. So you can actually sort of uh, flat pack it and take it with you. Yeah. It's, it's a big pain in the ass, but you can do it. Nice. Okay. You know? All right. Cool. <laughs> Well, so what do you do to, uh, like, did they figure out how to get rid of this 80 hertz lump that was going on in there? Is there, is there some trick for making the closet not sound so boomy? Yes. Um, man, I drove, I, I, I was like literally losing my mind trying, trying to get rid of that. Like 
I bought the Grace M103 channel strip. That's what I used for my voiceover uh, work in the booth, mm -hmm. just so I could notch out 80 hertz going in, which helped, but it's still, you know, it's a little unnatural, right? Right, right. Um, <laughs> and, I, you know, I might, I might qualify that and say that, uh, just remind us all that the human voice of all the instruments we do, the human voice is the one that we are most tuned to sounding natural or unnatural because it's the human voice. Exactly, right? We're the most critical of it if it sounds weird. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And um, so I was, I, 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 I had a test phrase that I would do. And if people could see me like doing these acoustic tests, they would just think I'm nuts. All I would do is I'd go in the booth after placing a bass track. Like I bought, I bought like six inch thick, um, um, like six PCF rock wool sheets, like the heaviest stuff you can get in terms of insulation for acoustics. Um, and I would wedge it up in the ceiling because I determined I could tell it was coming from the ceiling because when I would squat, all the bass would go away. But if, <laughs> but if I stood, I'm six foot one, right? I'm kind of close to the ceiling and it all resonated up there like this 80 hertz chamber. So I would like, I was literally like sweating ass, holding like really heavy pant, like just not even wrapped in fabric. I'm just like holding it, shaking, you know, I was a skinny guy at the yeah. time. I'm like, Ugh. and here's my audio test. I go, huh, huh, <laughs> huh. It, it, it almost sounds like a creepy, you know, AI, like doing some yeah. sexual act. It was really <laughs> disturbing if anyone ever got heard it, but, but I would listen, I wasn't even recording it. I would do it and I would listen with my own ears to determine how much bass was being taken out in my huh test. Interesting. <laughs> wow. So the solution after I gave up, right? Like I felt like I tried everything. He, um, he determined, he's like, you need to order, um, from GIK acoustics. who I love a specific, uh, tuned membrane to 80 Hertz. Ah, so Helmholtz resonator. Yes, yes, yes. I, I think I'm guessing that's what, I don't know if they use that term on these, these resonate or these, uh, I can't remember, but yeah, essentially the same. He was either going to build one for a certain price or GIK. And I went the GIK route and then hired the the guy who's handy. I'm not handy. He he built this like wire metal frame that held it up in the ceiling. Um, and that it didn't get rid of it entirely, but it reduced it a lot, probably by 60%. Hmm. So dude, it was a nightmare. Like it, yeah. small spaces are just nightmares for bass. Yeah, and I don't well, even have that low of a voice. Like I have low, like I have resonance, but I'm not like move, you know, I'm not the guys who just naturally sound like this all the time. Right. Right. So, so I, now is a good time for me to in, inject this anecdote. When, it, when my first internship was at a voiceover studio in St. Louis and they were doing stuff for Anheuser Busch and, you know, radio ads and, and stuff for um, videos. And, you know, the, the guy who was teaching me, my mentor there, he would talk about, um, the guys would come in and do the voiceover and the expression was like, some guys, they just sound like their balls are dragging on the floor as they walk <laughs> into the, the studio. They just have that deep of voice, you know? And their assistants so was, carrying them. Right. Yeah. I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I haven't heard, man, I, I've, I thought I've heard it all when it comes to deep voice descriptions, but <laughs> I, yeah, in, a, in, a, in our auditions, we get the spec or specifications of what they want it to sound like. And I've yet, I've heard gravelly, deep movie trailer voice, but ne never balls dragging behind you <laughs> yeah. deep. Well, That's, you could get in trouble in the cor uh, the corporate world for s that This reference. is true. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I've, I've seen some pretty offensive breakdowns and voiceover stuff. That's hilarious. <laughs> like just every, you name it, you know, no, 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 like straight up, you know, just horrible curse words, but the, the what, what was implied or intent, like just racial stuff, just oh, terrible. I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm like, I, wow. Probably, probably sometimes people don't even realize what they're doing when they that, do it, it. That is what it is all the time. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really just based on ignorance, but anyways. <laughs> um, all right, so, so you built your own studio, discovered all the challenges therein, also discovered that trying to fix something that's not right, like ultimately always leaves you feeling a little bit like it's just not quite, you know. Uh -huh. Um, but then when you got this portable one, tell us about that. Or because that's what you have now, right? You have a prefab portable one or you don't? Yeah, yeah. So what, what we have now is um, pretty much like my girlfriend and I, you know, she moved from Louisiana and then we bought a booth for her to have upstairs in Denver, which was um, a double wall vocal booth. Vocalbooth.com is the brand. Okay. And it's great. 
Um, you know, it's like a tan, carpety, ugly look, but it, it, it's it's how it sounds is what matters, right? So um, that's what she used. And then when we we when we left Denver, we abandoned my finely beautifully done booth in the basement and <laughs> had it had had to have it, you know, pretty much demolished. Ah, uh, you weren't uh, able to sell it to another voiceover talent. No, well, no, I was renting the house from uh, extended family, uh, and the per, you know, he's like, "What am I gonna do with like?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't need this giant tank. Like, like what it's essentially, it's a panic room to me. Right. right. He wasn't a jerk about it at all. Like I, I paid to have it demolished. Right. I knew the risk I was taking building it there. <laughs> yeah. I just wasn't planning to move to LA so quickly. But, um, so anyways, we move here with the one vocal booth, the prefab, right. And we share it for about a year. And then, um, she buys, uh, studio bricks, a yellow, beautiful, like the most beautiful booths you can buy in my opinion. This studio bricks. It's a company based in Spain mm -hmm. and it, it's essentially a giant Lego set. Like if there's four tiers, but each piece is very large and wide and heavy. And Wait, we got the thick... full on studio out of it, like music studio as well. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Room within a room. Wow. Yeah. You could any size you want. It's totally every part of it's customizable. It takes forever to get it because it takes like a month and a half to ship over the ocean and customs. And they're like, what's this? What better not be a bomb. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it takes me longer to just sit around watching a bunch of YouTube videos on how to mix, though. Yeah, exactly. It's it's still worth, dude. It's worth every penny. Um, so yeah, went went the studio bricks route this time and put it together in a day. And there was plenty of tweaking to do with my, you know, Type A ass afterwards. And I'm still not fully satisfied. I still want to get some more bass trapping in there in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. But wow, just from square one, is it? Oh, it's it looks beautiful. You don't have all this glue and other crap that you deal with building your own, you know, like my because I was going so crazy with the old booth in Denver um, with the base. I was ripping out like I, I, I glued in lots of type different types of insulation. So I was like ripping off the insulation to try something more dense and putting it in. And so it, it looked like it, it was the like it was the creepiest looking like glue residue. <laughs> booth you've like there's it was so nasty dude like <laughs> i did so, not feel like a pro working in there so you know in, in my studio here um i have one room that traditionally we might call uh, well i call it the phone booth now but it's it's got the <laughs> fabric and behind that is sort of like a uh, air gap and then then insulation and traditionally you call it a dead room in in recording studios yeah but i always yep. make the joke that like you know in the day in in the age of Netflix TV series, telling people that you built a con, a, a dead room in your converted garage just doesn't come off right. You know? No, no, it's it's going to put you on one of those like serial mind of a serial killer documentary right, shows. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so all right, so um, very interesting, man. So Studio Bricks, you you just order this booth and and you sort of do you design it online? You say exactly what size you need it to be. And then they just ship over a bunch of bricks. I mean, for you to build yeah. it in a day, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is because, uh, and frankly, the, you know, things like Whisper Room and these other ones, you can build it just as fast. But what's cool about this is it requires very minimal tools. Um, most of it, it literally just stacks on each other. Um, you need like a, like a mallet for things here and there. And I think a screwdriver just to put a few bolts in the feet, but everything from the ground up to the top, is you just it's like stack 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 and you just kind of you just kind of wedge it into place until it just locks and goes and then it falls into place wow and it's is it its own sort of floated floor and ceiling on the thing correct yeah um it's uh you can it has enough space that you can put insulation under it and so i didn't real I, I forgot that um it had a floating floor so the day of i had a friend here to help um because <laughs> it's heavy we got the triple wall right uh so it's really have you don't literally see the triple walls but it's like wedged together as the thickness of what a triple wall would be if that makes sense yeah and so it's really heavy needed a friend and i'm like oh yeah floating floor oh i could put insulation under it right could just to prevent even more vibrations from coming through you know we're in a house that's on a there's an air gap below our house in mm -hmm. california and there's cars driving by all the time I'm like oh whatever so i drive to lowe's and um, I get the 5.25 inch thick uh, um, Roxel, or right. I can't remember, safe and sound, I think. It's made out of recycled denim. I'm like, yes, perfect. 
I don't, I didn't measure how much the gap was going to be. So we lay it down and we're putting the floorboards on, if you will, to close it in. <laughs> and still to this day, like we, it's a little too thick. So the boards like on one part are kind of like bowed up. You can't really see it until you step on it. And you're like, oh, I just sunk a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is this, is this my first earthquake? Oh, oh you know. man. Uh, so that was, you know, it, it, that was pretty funny. But other than that, um, everything is went together beautifully. And I don't even remember what your question was at this well, point. So, so you build this thing oh, out of the day, bricks yeah. and then, um, and then once it's built, then you sort of treat the inside to your own design or does it come well, with the treatments and everything too? See, that's, what's so cool about it is you can, it, th- most people buy it with the treatment that comes with it. And, um, it's essentially, it's a two inch foam and by default, their model comes with, um, think of it as like a layer A, B, C, and D a being the lowest l- tier, you know, like your ankles mm-hmm. and then B knees and waist C so right. So forth D being your head. It only comes with uh, like B and C was covered in foam wrapped around you in the booth. I and the ceiling had uh, foam on it, mm-hmm. but that that was going to be too live for me because we already had a. Uh, you hear my cat meowing? Oh, yeah, it's all right. Oh. It's all right. Your cat does your your cat doesn't get its own <laughs> VO booth. Uh, he he should right now. So he doesn't interrupt the recording. No, <laughs> it's like he has this habit every time he gets fed. He then goes down to like the hallways, the studios, and he's just like, meow, I want more. I want more. So yeah. rock stars, we're going to remind you one more time that um, Jordan is not in the booth as we talk about the booth. This is just out in the control room. So yeah. Yeah. Just, they're like, wait a minute, what's this fancy booth? I, I thought he was a pro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to be comfortable and not sweating to death uh, inside a little booth for two hours. But, oh, that's, um, that's all right. So so um, it was too live. So then what'd you do to treat it and deaden it down? Well, here's the thing is I knew it was going to be too live. So I, I asked, I custom ordered it to come prefab glued on for the full tier. So pretty much there's only at the ankle level is their dry wall um, exposed, a hard surface. And then everything up there and all the way up to the ceiling is covered. Is that just so your ankles feel better about it or something? Yeah, or? my my ankles are very sensitive. And now, now, does that actually add a tiny bit of liveness to sort of balance it out, or is that just random? Well, it does. But what I forgot to mention is we we put in um, a uh, looks like a th- I think it's a four by three foot window, and then the door itself is entirely glass. So imagine like the uh, size of your bedroom door and the whole thing is a window. Okay. Now that was a mistake. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you already see where it's going. I'm sure any, you well, know, it's, 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 mm-hmm. it's similar to mine too. So, so, um, I, my bedroom room is the one or my, excuse me, my phone booth is the one room that I actually <laughs> finished myself. Um, you know, did all, you know, held the hammer in my hand and I put up the, um, we had the furring wood, that part was done, but then I, put the insulation in, and then I stretched uh, the burlap fabric over it. And then, you know, got that tacked down so that it was sounding great. And then I was like, all right, now I have to put up this trim wood, painted trim over where the staples went through the burlap so that it has a nice finished look to it. And so it now I, I describe it as looking kind of you know, circa 1970s Dixieland amusement park vibe <laughs> inside there. But it's um, but it was funny because I didn't realize it until I did it that even just putting in that wood trim livened the room back up a bit, you know? Yeah. And I then do. there's a glass mm-hmm. door too, which which of course is live as well. But you can really like you can go a long ways towards making a nice dead space and then just like take 10 steps backwards without even realizing it. Dude, I know. And and with how much like booth tweaking I've done on my own over the years. I'm just so sensitive to it. Um, and I, it's a good thing at the end of the day, but it's also a bad thing. So it, it will, it distracts from my performance. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, when we got it, uh, we wanted the, the, the glass door cause it's sexy. Right. But by default, this model doesn't come, it comes with a, just a solid core door. And that's for acoustical reasons too, because what happens you have a, the, the booth we have right now is a five by five and one, you have a, glass surface on one side and then you have another larger glass surface not perpendicular not parallel but perpendicular but even then it doesn't matter because the room is so small that you're going to get a glassy reflecty sound 
it's not terrible. And most people didn't notice it. Like even my audio friends, they're like, oh yeah, I hear it, but it, you know, it sounds kind of live and nice. I'm like, I hate it. I hate it. It's driving me nuts. You know? right. <laughs> so, um, so I literally like, I have a desk in a small desk in there with wheels and I would, <laughs> so back to me being like the, the creepy making vocal noise for acoustic test man. Um, it, now I'm here in LA, a new booth. And now I have a different vocal test where I'm like, Hey, this is Jordan Reynolds. Hey, this is Jordan Reynolds. Hey, this is Jordan Reynolds. So I'm listening to how the, the, the S's hit the walls, how the mm -hmm. J, J, the J, and I'm just, I'm doing it on repeat with my cans on monitoring how my mic is picking it up and just literally like moving this cart like it's a walker. Wow. <laughs> In this, in this tiny space, like I wedged it in the corner. I went against the window. I went against the door. I like, I literally was trying to find a space where I, God forbid, do I have to add an ugly ass curtain in front of this, this beautiful glass door. Right. Right. <laughs> and I eventually did. And you it eventually sounds so much. Curtain in. Yeah. It, yep. I eventually did about a month in, I couldn't take it anymore. And it sounds so much better. That's so funny. <laughs> what a trip. Well, uh, keep describing for us a little bit just before we pause and take a break here. Um, describe to us what go what needs to be in the space with you. So if you're recording yourself in your own VO, you're probably running your Pro Tools rig or whatever you're recording with, right, as well from in there, but you can't have the hard drive and the computers and everything. Yeah, man. Um, ever since I started, actually, yeah, I've... I've had four studios, if you will, in different, let me wait, three, three, well, yeah, four in a way, as far as where I'm recording. And from day one in that little slide in door closet with the, the moving blankets stapled. <laughs> and, and sometimes I'd love, by the way, at my day job, I would unpack a lot of like computer hardware. And sometimes there would be the, uh, open cell foam. Mm -hmm. And like, that was, which is rare. It's usually the closed cell, which is kind of, it just doesn't absorb much sound, but I'd find the black, like squishy Oralex like stuff. Right. And I would like, it would be a, it would be like six inches by, by four inches, the smallest little turd piece of foam you could find. I'm like, oh, I'm going to put this in my booth and it's going to sound so much better. Gold, and I, pure gold. And I would, yeah. So yeah, so I'd take it home and I'd like just staple it on crooked on the wall that I face where I do my VO practice reads, you know, cause I wasn't making any money at that point yet. <laughs> and it was right. like, it just looked so ghetto. <laughs> but so anyways, but starting from that booth all the way through then the walk-in closet that I had at the new place, which was still the, the best sounding booth acoustically into the, 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 the drywall custom tank booth that was built in that same room and into this prefab booth that I now work in, in the studio bricks. I've always mirrored my set. Oh, wait, that's a lie. Sorry. No, only in the, the last two booths, I've, I've mirrored the setup that I have at my control desk. Meaning I have um, a, a monitor, an LCD monitor, a keyboard, mouse, and a headphone amp and headphones. Those are all the essentials that go in the booth. Nothing else goes in the booth. So, so I the, So the, I can the control keyboard everything. and the uh, monitor, that's all just directly plugged into the same studio computer that's out in the control room. Correct. So I run an X, long XLR cables for the headphone amp and the mic going all the way um, from my mixing desk into the booth through a hole. And then I have a, lo an, a USB extension cable with a USB hub in the booth for the mouse and keyboard and, and even a webcam, which I use for sessions sometimes. Some clients like right, to right. sit there and watch you, I guess. <laughs> well, you just have a lot of internet work where you're probably doing voiceover for somebody who's, you know, not even in the same city. Absolutely. That's how I built my career. In Denver, there's not much of a market, you know, that not certainly not enough to pay your bills. It's you got to go online. You know, that's, that's where most of my clients still are is that's online. One stuff. of the really cool things about doing voiceover work um, so let's say you're in, in middle America or somewhere else in the world, you've got a studio, you're trying to do some music, you can do some elements of remote music, you could remotely mix, master, you can do overdubs for somebody, but voice is one of those few things that you can probably do pretty close to real time because you don't have to overdub on something necessarily, right? You can you can really have somebody producing over Skype or something like that while you're doing all the recording work and sending it to them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, most of my sessions are what it's, it's called a foam patch. And 
that's just an old school term because people used to have physical hardware boxes like a rack mount unit, right. which plugged into a dedicated phone line, which had like an XLR in and out. <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah. And I know there's studios, I think still use them. Um, but I've ever since I've started, I, I just use Skype and I have thanks to my total mix, uh, software for my RME unit, I can customize the routing of what app talks to what and, so I have playback so I can, uh, they hear my live mic on my virtual phone number. They don't know it's virtual. They, they just call a phone number and all of a sudden they hear me on, on my mic in my booth. Yeah. Um, the, all they need to hear is just what is my performance? They don't care. They trust that my home studio is already going to have a, a clean noise floor that I'm not popping my peas too much. <laughs> right. Right. Um, that's that they that's all assumed nowadays whereas back in you know the 90s everything you go into a studio right and that's still now that i live in la i'm going into studios often for for bookings like that's still because you can because because you can but also because a lot of it's like really really difficult you know like dubbing there's you got to move the the beeps every take and you got to the director's like, hey, can you can you take the uh, uh, take you know sentence two of take A and sentence three of take sixty four and you know put them together and make you know, right. And wow. I can do that, but that takes me out of performance mode, right? As right. a talent from home. So, well, let's get back into that more in depth here in just a moment. When we get back for the jam session, um, but we'll take a break for just a moment. Rock stars. A reminder that you can find links to what we're talking about in the show notes, including a YouTube playlist with a bunch of. Um, Jordan's demo reels and, you know, just hear him doing all these great voices and some uh, video games where you're the voice of different characters who are usually dressed in like leather and chaps and carrying a staff or a giant sword and that sort of thing, right? If only Uh, those chaps were assless. (laughs) Well, you know, in the video game world, anything, anything's possible. But um, (laughs) we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. If you want to design and build a great house, then you're going to need great tools. You could build it with an old hammer and some nails, but it's a whole lot easier to use an air compressor and a nail gun. Well, the same thing goes for mixing. If you really want to create a pro-sounding mix, then it makes a lot of sense to start with a great toolbox of awesome plugins. This is where Boz Digital Labs comes in to help you get killer mixes easily, quickly, and creatively. Provocative will make your vocals sound lush and wide. Transgressor and Manic Compressor can help your drums leap out of the speakers. Katie Wadey and Big Beautiful Door offer unique new ways to tighten up your tracks, while The Wall will make sure your mixes are in your face and competitive. And my favorite is Sasquatch Kick Machine, which can transform your kick drum from sounding like a home studio cardboard box into the perfect punchy kick without using samples or triggers. To download your unlimited trial of any plugin now or get one of Boz's free plugins, go to bozdigitallabs.com and put the best in your mixing toolbox. Click the link below in the show notes to learn more. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting color 
aberrations and distortions. Make sure to check out the Black Hole series BH1S and BH2 with the awesome looking hole in the middle of the mic, combining innovative industrial design with meticulous electrical engineering to help your studio sound incredibly expensive for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the US, and 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, if you use the coupon ROCKSTAR, you will get an astonishing 50% off. I got one. You're hearing my voice right now on the BH1S. So what are you waiting for, rock stars? Go to jzmike.com or click the link in the show notes below. Jordan, you ready to rock? Yeah. All right, sweet, man. I guess I asked you that the first time. I'm supposed to say, Jordan, are you ready to jam? I'm ready to jam now that I've rocked. All right, hot diggity. Um, let's talk about your experience developing a mic for voiceover. Cool. Let's do it. Tell us about that. Um, that was awesome and beyond an honor to be <laughs> uh, th th to have Matt, the amazingly brilliant Matt McGlynn, at, th at then Recording Hacks and then was developing. Man, I, I don't know if I have the timeline right. I don't know if Roswell was like fully established yet. Maybe I think he just maybe had the, the mini K47s. I can't remember the timeline, but Roswell was new in its infancy. Yeah. And um, he wanted to design a mic specifically for voiceover, you know, just just because and there's a lot of VO mics or mics that are used for VO out there, but they all have their pros and cons. And, and a common complaint, um, especially for Matt, uh, but plenty of audio engineers you hear in this town is that is is sibilance is and a, a lot of low end tends mm -hmm. to be kind of an issue. And they just want kind of a clean, pure, just straightforward, present sound. That isn't too punchy like a radio dynamic mic, but isn't too uh, bright and crispy like, you know, a Sony C8000, you know, or, you know, right. or you know, like they don't need, or like a C12, like we don't need something super crispy. This is, we're not making a pop record. Um, so he, his brilliant ass just soldered together uh, various, like he would send me a, a four mics at a time with masking tape on them, you know, A, B, C, and D. Wait, A, B, C, D. Wait. <laughs> right. So he would do, I, did I, I, he do I felt like, like I only said three letters, but did I say four? <laughs> I think you did, yeah. He okay. would do, he would do um, uh, different mic <laughs> voicing so you could try each one out and see which one sounded best. Yeah, yes. And I did it as scientific as possible. But if I recall, I, you know, I didn't have one of those like fancy, like, you know, hold four mics in the exact position mic right. stands, nor did I, I think I had at least four mic stands, but I think I only recorded... Um, two at a time because I didn't, when you have four at a time at a certain, it's really difficult to get an accurate center or, or where you would typically record a VO angle with four oh, large well, dive. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, that. right. I mean, we try and do that in the studio sometimes and you can't really do that. You kind of no, have to, you kind of have know, to, it, you, there's a, the, 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 um, sorry to interrupt again, but the, um, I don't know. the voice and I think even instruments, there's like a, a mental laser beaming that we do. To yep. hit the mic just right. Yep, exactly. And you can't, there's always, if you have four up, in my opinion, no matter how tightly they place they are together, and even if you get, you know, in VO, we, we, we uh, kind of a rule of thumb was, is we start at the hang loose distance right. from your lips to the capsule, or not to the cap, but to the front of the grill. That's actually it's what like I tell good, people for the podcast, too. It's not, nice. it's not a bald fist, but you have to, your thumb and your pinky go out, too. Yeah, so which which might thing. be too far for like gangly ass Jack Skellington fingers like mine, but um, but for <laughs> or or people who have very tiny hands. But overall, people with normal size hands, uh, it's it's a great starting point um, to keep to manage your distance. And with shotguns, you can go a little bit further, um, which I'm 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 definitely a little bit further than the hang loose distance. Just chilling here because I'm trying to be more comfortable and not. I feel like I'm in a perfect, you know, VO session, but, um, but you're on a shotgun now or you're on a, um, just a cardioid. No, I'm on the shot. I'm on the shotgun right now. Okay. Cause you had mentioned the AT 2020 and the Sennheiser, a uh, Sennheiser MKH 416. And are both of those shotguns? No, no. And, and I kind of, I'm sure I lumped them into the same sentence. No, I mentioned them together because what I normally have up at my desk out here and I'm only record, I'm never even recording out here unless I'm doing like a video or something. I'm using the mic at my desk 99% of the time as a talkback mic, right. whether I'm directing talent remotely, directing talent in the booth behind me, 
or I'm, um, uh, or I'm coaching mm-hmm. my, I, I do a little bit of coaching for voice talent. So, or just Skype calls in general, I'm using the AT 2020 is usually what's up because it can stay out. It's, it's, it's a cheap mic. It's, I've had it forever since 2008. I don't need to, you know, cover it every night. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Interesting. Um, so do you have to, is that one of the things you do to really take care of your, your, you know, your top voiceover mic is you actually cover it so that it won't you get know, dust on it and stuff? <laughs> let's keep it real. I, I used to. <laughs> well, I have to do that for my Coles 4038, if I remember to, because the magnet is so strong, it'll actually pull in you know, magnetic particles out of the atmosphere. That's crazy. Out of the atmosphere. Yeah, out, of the just, atmosphere. Out, of, out of the multiverse. Just ju- you'll wake up and <laughs> Jupiter will be stuck on the capsule. It's crazy. <laughs> All right. That's great, man. Well um, but uh, no, that that's a that's a that's a. I don't have those kinds of problems dealing with you know the theory of uh, black holes and and dark matter. But no, I I, I should I don't. But um, luckily, it's like they they stay out in the booth. I don't keep the door close to the booth. I keep the door open, but not a ton of airflow is getting into it. You right, know, because right. it's, it's <laughs> that, that's what I tell myself to make myself feel better about not taking care of my mics like they're my firstborn, like I used to. Um, so the uh, the VO mic, the Roswell, um, you're talking about getting, making sure that it doesn't have too much low end um, and, yes. and that the sibilance isn't just nasty sounding, I guess, right? Or it's not too sibilant. Correct. And it's it's really hard to find that balance because remember, everyone's voice varies. But female voices in particular... Um, they, I don't know what it is. I, I'm not a, you know, speech language pathologist, but there's something about the female voice where most of the time, if you compare a female voice to a male voice, their, their sibilance is just, it's harsher. It's more, it's, it's louder. It's more apparent. It's more focused. Mm -hmm. It's, it's sharper. I mean, that's pretty much all saying the same thing, but all of those, you know, it can be very difficult. There's only so much you can do with a mic that already has a boost in the top end, which a lot of mics already do. Like the TLM 103, for example, um, for female, and it varies in females as far as the sibilance, but, but there are a lot that have a very sharp sibilance, um, so much so you can hear it just with your own ear. But when you have a mic like the TLM 103, it's going to pick it up way more. And you can record extra off axis or more off axis to reduce that sibilance and that does help. But even then there are just some voices where the sibilance is just so bright that it's that you go more off axis and it's going to, you start hearing, you know, sounds like they're literally off mic. Um, so uh, speaking of female voiceover talent, I wanted to make sure we gave a shout out to Christy Bowen. Christy who is Bowen. A, yeah. She, she is a, a voiceover talent and a, and a mutual parent at my daughter's middle school here in Nashville who uh, helped connect us for this interview. That's yeah. It's a small world, man. And Thank she you, also Christy. uses the uh, the Roswell Ravo. She said, she which is. was sort of our introduction, our, our our introduction as we were talking about all this stuff. And I thought that was so cool. Yeah, I, it's dude, it's such a small world, the voiceover community, but also it, the audio community, as you know, it's like it's a little bigger than the than the v, VO community, but it's still really tiny. Yeah, um, and let's see, I guess we'll give a shout out too. I believe you guys have a conference, an annual conference that goes on where people who are interested in this can go learn a ton about voiceover. Yeah. Oh yeah. VO Atlanta. Um, uh, she, I think she's running, I don't know her exact title, but she's handling all the virtual side of things. I think Mm -hmm. she's like the virtual manager, which sounds like a really hard job. Um, I'm, I'm running a few breakout sessions and, and classes on voiceover demos on the do's and don'ts, how to find a reputable reputable producer, um, and what agents are looking for to get you signed. Um, so cool. I'll cool. be very busy. <laughs> yeah, I bet. But I'm really stoked. I'm because there's so much bad information and frankly slimy people out there who will take your money for people as, aspiring voice talent. And I want to steer people clear of that stuff. All right. Well, let's jump right into some of the how-to stuff. So. Um, a hang tan is a good distance from a vocal mic um, for for doing your voiceover. You don't really want a mic that is boosting a bunch of top and a bunch of bottom. Um, but but sometimes we do want a voice to sound like it has the, your balls dragging on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe not if you're a female voiceover talent. But <laughs> how do you get that? How do we get do- that sound? Because I've I've tried to do voice before and it's like, 
I'm listening to some radio comparison thing and I'm like, how in the world does it sound like that? So you're asking, how do you get like a really clear, punchy, like, uh, like, like, a like, like a movie trailer sound? Yeah, okay. that huge, deep, low end sound. I mean, again, it very like there's no like, oh, I'll, you, you make your compressor. It's a six to one ratio. And, you know, it's like I wish that there's no straightforward answer to that question. But what I generally do is, uh, you know, you can cut just just cut what you don't need in EQ, first of all, um, even if you're trying to get a low end. So let's say we're, let's say our, our starting point is a male voice that is maybe like mine. It's like it's a mid range voice, right? It's got some low end resonance, but it's not just all low end. Mm -hmm. And I want it to sound extra punchy. Of course, when you're recording, you can definitely uh, one of the easiest things is proximity, right? Mm -hmm. If I get more up on the mic like this, Skype's only going to demonstrate so much, but you can hear some of this. I'm sure that I'm right up on the mic. Yeah. Right. But then there's risks of popping peas. You hear mouth noise and mouth clicks more, stuff like that. But this is a great starting point uh, as long as you're not screaming. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's just really intense stuff and you can even talk quieter. So that's right, the really... Right, you get the more the, gravel too when you do that. Exactly. That's the easiest thing from the get-go is get it right at the source, man. Now, but, what, what about popping peas? Do you use a pop filter like we do in the studio with, with singers? Or do you have to yeah. train yourself to never have peas? <laughs> Honestly, I, I uh, uh, yes, I do use pop filters. Like on the 416 right now, I have the windscreen, you know, which is a pop filter in itself. Mm -hmm. um, I pretty much always keep the windscreen on, um, even though it's ugly as hell and it doesn't look as cool. But it, um, but with the 416, with shotgun mics, you don't have to be, you can go like you can, you know, they're meant for film sets, right? So you can have it like pretty above you or at an angle and at a distance. In other words, at a very safe distance to where your peas, the air of your, your plosives won't travel and hit the capsules easily, even without a pop filter. So that's really the, one of the few mics you can get away with, um, a condenser wise is a shotgun mic without any sort of pop filter or windscreen if you place it right. Um, but most all, all my condenser mics, I, I hate, I hate the pop filters that they're just in your way, right? Like the traditional ring mesh right. filters that are like four inches, I think in diameter, like it's really difficult to, to, to do a, a stellar authentic performance as a voice talent and have literally what your right eye is looking through mesh <laughs> at, at this, at the screen in front of you or the script or the copy stand with the script. And then the left eye can see the script clearly. Dude, or, in the words of the Beastie Boys, men never rock the mic with the pantyhose. <laughs> <laughs> yep, there you go. That's that should be more popular in voiceover, but yeah. But again, this is this is my personal preference. No steadfast rule, but um so to so that but again, a pop filter never blocks all peas. You know this. Singers know this like um so going at an angle I, I always do everything at a slight off axis angle, like a 45, if that degree, just super slight. Never, I'm never directly facing the mic. Mm -hmm. um, never, ever. So it's uh, like your laser beam is just off the mic. Yep. Yeah. I put the mic on the side. And so the viewpoint of my eyes and the talent's eyes that I'm miking can see straight ahead without something in their face. The pop filters I do use are the uh, WinTech. Okay. Um, they're, they're so cool. They, uh, it's like, it's, it's, I think it's a thin metal mesh screen, but it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's like a half of, or it's like a C shape and it's got little rubber bands and you literally strap it over the mic basket. Okay. So, so it's, real it's close really to discreet. The mic. Yeah. It's so it is closer. So peas get, you know, you don't have full control as far as how much air is traveling, you know, between your pop filter is, uh, in the capsule, right? Cause it's, but Again, combine that to, to just get maybe some of the harsh peas just enough so they don't hit the capsule too hard and mic off axis, you're going to be in good shape. Yeah. Um, now, what about S's and sibilants? How do you, um, is it, is it a, again, is that something you just have to train your voice for? Or are there some tricks to cut down on the S's too? I remember uh, hearing other producers talk about like putting a pencil in front of the mic and things like that. Oh, that, that may have been for the pop filters too. That is, uh, you know, I've heard it. You know, I haven't heard the pencil for the S's, I don't think, but that would work because it's just essentially it's diminishing the amount of harsh air, if you will, that's hitting the capsule, right? Mm -hmm. that, the, that the capsule's sensitive to. Um, I've only heard the pencil or the finger 
trick for, for plosives. And, and if I find a, I, I happen to be at an angle where I keep popping my peas during a read, either if I'm in a studio or I'm at home, I will, I, <laughs> I've trained myself when the peas are coming, I literally jerk my head very subtly at an angle on that P. So if I'm going to say the word, um, Hey, let's go to that place. Right. So I'll, uh, you can't see me, but once the P comes, I go, I, I'll try to demonstrate it close on mic so you can hear it. Hey, let's go to that place. I don't know if you could hear that, but no, kind of well, the PL was went off a little off mic, but it's subtle, but the P didn't pop. Well, now give us one where you, where you make the P pop. Um, Hey, let's go to that place. Wait, that. <laughs> <laughs> Skype Sky may be cutting it out on us a little bit. Oh, let's go to that place. There you go. Yeah, we kind of hear that. Yeah. Yeah. See, shotguns are harder to pop. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right. Now, um, so so plosives are really important. Um, S's also are important. What but about S's? You can you can do more repair work in post. I don't worry too much. Like if something's really harsh sounding, I either just change the mic on on the talent, um, or I just. I go more off axis, right? I try to find a sweet spot that still captures the full body and resonance of their voice, but tames the S as much as possible going in. Yeah. But dude, there's so many good DSing plugins now, but I do a lot, like that's a whole conversation how I do DSing. It's it's very, lots of little things added up to reduce the S's. Interesting. Well, do you want to go there? Yeah, if you want, totally, sure. man. It's your show. <laughs> how do you how do you do the lots of little things to make the DSing just right? So luckily, now this would be terrible if you're like doing it for an audiobook, right? But we got to keep in mind what I'm editing, if it's my own stuff, which I don't have harsh sibilance, luckily. So I don't do this on my own voice. I just run a light DSer if a client wants me to process it afterwards, which is very rare. But for talent, let, let's talk about all the talent I'm recording and producing demos for whether from their home studio or from here, doesn't matter. Everyone's got sibilance, especially females in particular. And um, I start with, I try to get as much out with um, uh, a de plug plugin. And I kind of bounce around between, but my favorite ones right now are the EO, EOSIS, is that how you say it? EOSIS okay. de -esser. I love that one because you can get super specific. It's got a, um, a voiceover uh, mode, which just reacts differently. It's not as aggressive as, as a traditional singing, um, de -esser. and it's got a built-in EQ, which you can like boost what it's taking out when it's not sibilant. It's really cool. Um, I love the new, I think it's pretty new, the waves sibilance plugin. Mm -hmm. That's really effective. But what I'm doing with these is I'm doing, I'm, I'm making it just kiss it kind of like, kind of like a, a, a last resort hard limiter, right? You just want it to slap down a few dB on the really harsh ones. Otherwise, you just hear it and it starts sounding sloppy. Right. Because voiceover, like people hear it. Like you said, it's the human voice, right? You can't give them, you can't make everyone sound like, you know, like, you know, Sylvester, <laughs> a cat, right? Right. <laughs> so, um, so I start there, but that's rarely gets the job done to my standards, at least. <laughs> um, so after that, I might even run two DSers, Right. Uh, like just at a very gentle setting as opposed to one aggressively slamming it. But one of my biggest tricks is I, I use Persona Studio One, um, but this can be achieved in any DAW. What I do is I find um, the S itself, very easy to identify in a waveform. And I'm only doing this for very short clips, right? My demos are one to two minutes long. And so one to two minutes of, of spoken word. That's not a lot to manually. Not like um, two hours of podcast audio. Correct, right? So, that you know, use this, you know, tip it as as you, much as you want, but uh, it, it you, you might go crazy if you try it for a two hour podcast. <laughs> um, but if if there's just at least an S that's bugging you, what I do on the ones that are still bugging me is I uh, I crop it. So I, I, I make it its own event or in Pro Tools to be called a region. Right. And then... Um, or a clip. I, correct, yes. And and the one way to do... I think John... I got this from John Tidy from what I, years ago. He just manually turns down that the S there on uh, using clip gain. Right. Or you could automate it in post. But I try to... I want to do it before it's hitting all the compressors and EQs, which only enhances it, right? Mm -hmm. So I try to do it pre-processing. So I, I grab that region and I turn that down. I used to do that, but what I do now is even more surgical. So instead of just turning down the whole S, I grab, um, I don't know if Pro Tools has this because I'm not proficient in Pro Tools, but in Studio One, you can take, uh, they have this thing called event effects. 
or region effects if it existed in Pro Tools, where you can grab any plugin you want and slap it on inside that one region or event only. Right, right. Can you do that in Pro Tools? Uh, yep. Yeah, well, you right. can do it with built-in with their stuff. I can't remember. I don't think you can do it with third-party plugins yet, but it's probably coming. Okay, and that's fine. I, I, I use sometimes I use third-party stuff for like pitch shifting and things like that on events, but most of the time I'm grabbing the built-in EQ in Studio One. I drag it over, slap it on that 1S, and then I play it back. And you can, I use the, um, my ears as much as possible, but when it comes to just a, a quick S, it's much easier to see where it's, where it, most of the buildup is happening on the parametric EQ, right? right. You see it building up and, and everyone's different, man. Like some pe- some women, it's like, whoa, 8K, it's getting crazy. And, and some, like I had this one girl, it was mostly harsh at like 12K. Wow, that's really super high. high. Yeah. I, I'm always struggling with um, combinations. I find that like the six to seven seems to be a male S range that, that needs some a little bit of love, but not too much. And then so, two to three K is where all the ch and sh yeah, stuff is I know. really harsh. And that's when you manually grab. Yeah, I have that too. There'll be some chuz and shuz that are all those chuz and shuz just all getting those in the chuz way. Chuz and shuz. <laughs> but you, what you can do, man, is you can manually go grab where it's peaking and just just pull it down. Just to just just do a scoop right there. Yeah. That's yep. all I do. And sometimes, you know, it's it's six or to eight dB. And it's still totally intelligible, and it doesn't sound like a, it doesn't. You don't hear an a, something actively turning something down from a threshold perspective. Right? So, so a couple of thoughts on that. One is that um, you can also do that. Uh, uh, some of the things that actually get lost in music is the K at the end or the D at the end of words. Yeah, um, people just forget to say them. They say these really for some reason. People sing really strange English. And they don't realize yeah. it. But, but I know. Well, yeah, like Brits Brit sound American, right? <laughs> right. You can you can go in and just take that same that K, find the K that's sort of missing in your track, chop that out, and boost the hell out of it, and get it to just the level where you can hear it through the music, which is kind of good. But I was yep. going to share an anecdote about my first internship at the voiceover place and the engineer I was working with. He. Um, at one point we were doing, God, we were doing like a, a, a Goodwill video, I think it was. And there was a, um, a kid on there who was talking, who did have a lisp, you know, and sure, just yeah. c- couldn't really speak very clearly. And so it wasn't clear enough. So, so the engineer went into the control room. I went into the mic. Oh no, I see where this is going. <laughs> oh no. He just like made all these consonants and then he brought them in and he just flew them right in and then oh, brought out. God. Made it so that we could understand what the kid was saying, and um, oh my god, you know, a whole other discussion to discuss, you know, what that uh, the the deeper meanings, sociological <laughs> meanings of that. But I let, let's just say yeah, I was we'll, very we'll pass impressed. On that for now. Yeah, I was like, that's cool, dude. Yeah, I know no, you can. That. Mm, that's that. That I have not done that. Um, I don't think I will do that for a talent. But <laughs> <laughs> but no, no. But again, it goes to show the power of the software and and your tools, right? Like yeah. you can get real. I've gotten really creative. I can't think of anything in particular. But as far as just we call it making a Franken take in voiceover, mm-hmm. we do it all the time. We record our auditions at home alone, and. We want them to sound as good as possible. And, you know, the caveat is you better if you if you record 20 takes and you take like the word the from that one and then the word, you know, pie from this one and the word beetle from this one. And you put (laughs) and you put those all together into which is the beetle pie. Yeah. Yeah. Build up beetle pie. I don't know where that came from, but uh, it's um, you better be able to reproduce that as a human. Right. With your voice as opposed to how you edited it. Right. And um, and that's the challenge we face as, as talent and also what I do in demo producing. Um, but at the end of the day, when you go into a, a commercial session as a voice talent, they'll record, you know, might be five takes, might be 30. And they will do the same thing. They'll take the first three words from take A and so, so forth and make what sounds the best to them. Right. But that's what happens because we have the power to do it. All right. So, um I remember seeing a video. It was a, I feel like it was a demo of something by Adobe where they were making this thing where they typed in words and and the computer generated the voice. It did a it mapped out the human voice and then they then it regenerated new words based on what was typed in. Is that something you've seen? 
Yeah. And yeah, no, that's not scary or anything. (laughs) You know, it's not like how I make a living. That's like, yeah, that's like asking a drummer. Hey man, have you heard of a drum machine? (laughs) (laughs) What do you think of easy drummer? Um, yeah, no dude, crazy shit. That that shit, that shit is scary. Um, I'm going to take our jobs machines, right? It's, it's crazy. Um, I don't know a lot about it, uh, but I'm going to embrace it as much as possible. Voice but packs, not... dude. Voice packs, just like sample yeah. packs. Yeah. Um, seriously. No, I'm not that familiar with it, but let me put it this way. Um, Voice Town are talking about it. I'll bet. Yeah. I'll bet. We all have varying uh, <laughs> degrees of fear, right? Well, uh, we're all still going to be tasked with making sure everything sounds great. So, Right. There we go. Let's see. That's why I got my... I, I'm. I, I have my two skill sets. I have audio and voiceover, so I think I'll be safe. But um, in well, short, let me put it this way, man. It's going to be a long time before, if you want a convincing performance, right? Yeah, totally. Which is where the trend is. Like, you, you're hearing less and less of the, hey, guy, every, you know, check it out on KO12, like the over the top radio guy, right? You don't hear, you hear it like on cheap local ads, but even then, those are all this, all of the stuff that has more mass appeal, whether it's a video game performance, cartoons are becoming less wacky voice, right? You don't hear as much of that anymore. You hear just more of a flavor of someone. You're like, yeah, that could be a real person. All they want is very authentic sounding performances in commercial and promo in video games and animation. Mm-hmm. And because of that, these things that are can supposed to re- easily replicate the human voice, they have a long way to go to interpret such subtle nuances and beats that a human trained, highly skilled voice actor would make totally. in a performance when reading a script. Like the, that, that's what, that's what we get paid, you know, good money for as voice talent is because we have so much time and training and, and, and actually, you know, a soul to determine like context and, and who we're talking to and what, like how we feel about it. What, a, what vocal constriction sounds like when we're upset, you know, you can only emulate that so much. So it's got a long ways to go for it before it becomes convincing. And I think it's just going to replace, I think people just doing cheap stuff, like really cheap commercials who don't want to hire a voice talent, which is fine. Those, that's where it's going to start building, you know, and it's going to take a long way to get to the top to Super Bowl commercial level. (laughs) Yes. And same thing in music. I mean, music has been trying to replicate the human performance in digital world for a long time. And it's still not there. I mean, it's, there are some things that sound very, you know, they sound very appropriate for certain productions, although production itself has sort of left the human world and gone to, gone to computery stuff. But um, two things I can say about that. One is that, like, you still can't get the computer, you know, automatic things to sound quite like a real player playing. And two is a real person playing music or doing voiceover talent can come up with a right answer way faster than a computer trying to, trying to, it's like trying to edit your way into doing the right thing. It's so much faster to just get it right at the source and perform it right to begin with. Exactly. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh, using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. These techniques would work for you in whichever DAW you are using right now. And if mixing is your focus, then check out my free course, Mix Master Bundle, where I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins in Pro Tools. Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix Master bundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Um, okay, cool. So I wanted to go back and ask you about the, uh, how to get massive low end on your voice question one more time. <laughs> so you, you said my understanding of what your answer was, was start by EQing out the stuff you don't need 
and then you can start manipulating it. But what are some of the mixing tricks that help us get a voice to just have this big, massive low end? Like, should we be using subharmonic uh, filtery things, or is it just all EQ and compression? Do you just have to have somebody with that kind of voice to begin with? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> um, other than starting at the source and having a mic that already is more, fla- you know, favorable to the low end and making sure your proximity, right, is as close as possible mm-hmm. without a, distorting or sounding like you're eating the mic, like eating it. Right. Um, uh, you, as you know, in audio, like if you pull out, for example, a good chunk of the mid range, everything will sound way brighter all of a sudden and way punchier in the low end, mm-hmm. right? You can do the same thing on a voice. You can't do as extreme of stuff without it sounding weird, but find where it's like the eh, 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 the nasally, like I'm making that, that's that's my 1K test, by the way, that right, I do in the booth, because right. I've got a 1K peak in my current booth with the, with the glass, so uh, that's my new one. Eh, 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 I'm weird, but that's what I do. That's great. Right? Um, so, but, you know, listen for where those, where it's kind of, where you're, you're you're kind of twitching a little bit from when the voice, you know, when it eh, has that part in the voice, pull some of that down quite a bit and then just see how much like, ooh, it's more present down there. Then from there, you know, you can use, he, the heavier the compression you do, the more the low end will come out. But I find, I like to use compressors that are color, if you're really, if you're going for that more punchy sound, which I don't do a lot of because it's just not as in demand anymore. They want it just to be present, clear, and 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 rich and beautiful, but not Natural, like right? yeah, right. So I am not. I don't have like a formula for it, but if I have to exaggerate it, I'm going to use colored plugins. I'm going to use um, like tube preamp emulators and drive it just enough before it's distorting, mm-hmm. right? Because that tends to add like a nice thick gooey sound to it. And and to, um, to put some context on this, we're talking about the monster truck rally voice here, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Right. Exactly. Um, but there's certain like don't don't use a stock compressor. You're not gonna you can get it, but it's like they're just clean. Like the, the Fab Filter Pro C, uh, it's one of my favorite plugins because it's so transparent. Mm-hmm. But I would not I would never reach for that to get a punchy deep. Uh, monster truck sound, I would grab something like the Waves H comp. Right. Um, right. Or the, oh, what else are some, some, uh, let's see. The, about- the, 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 uh, oh, McDSP, uh, compressor, the, um, the, the true, what's it called? The tube, the tube moo, the cow, moo, the one that has a cow, <laughs> it's like a cow thing on it. Was it the um, retro compressor? The no, it's, it's, the the, com- it's the it's the ultimate compressor. Ultimate compressor, yeah. The sixty and there's one in there, ultimate compressor. Yes, and there's a compressor in there called like the tube tube moo or something. <laughs> nice. Moo tube. I think it's moo tube. Yeah, probably like mu, like uh, very mu. Yeah. Compressor, yeah. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. I think that's what it's based off of. Um, but okay, yeah, eleven so- eleven uh, LA two A's uh, add some nice low end. Uh, those are great, uh, but no, they're 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 a little bit cleaner. So yeah, so something to be more analogy emulate-y, uh, to kind of get those 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 harmonics going on there, but don't get it distorted sounding. Otherwise, it's going to sound stupid. Right, right. Okay, all right, cool. And then, is there ever a call for some kind of subharmonic synthesizer plugin, like um, uh, you know, just like the various different bass enhancer plugins? You know, I haven't experimented in my, like a ton with exciters and and that kind of stuff on the voice. Because when I have it, it always just sounds so unnatural. Right. Um, but ones like 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 um, Slate Digital has, uh, I think it's made by, I think it's made by Eosis. But it's like the Air EQ, but they have one that has like a, a low a bottom end one and then a top end. There's like Air and Earth. I think it's what's called. The, and there's the Earth one. And you can either turn up like the punchy knob or there's a punchy mode or just a thick mode. Mm-hmm. I have, don't know which frequencies is touching, but it's clearly for bass. And I find dialing that up a little bit um, on a male voice that isn't already too boomy from the booth or their voice or whatever, that tends to, to, to thicken it up a bit. Okay, very cool. Um, earlier, we were joking about uh, what we put in our coffee and you made, you know, you said something about dairy and it reminded me to ask you, um, what, what should people know about, you know, what to eat or don't eat before voiceover stuff? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, 
don't follow my advice, what I did today, because I'm pretty mouth clicky today. So <laughs> I'm like chewing on gum right now. Nice. Uh, because so by the way, that's a trick is I, I chew like if I if it's going to be about five minutes between takes in a session, I'm like extra mouth clicky. I feel bad for the engineer. Um, if I'm not if I don't get to declick it myself afterwards, if I'm in, a, in an actual studio, I chew on gum and it gets your mouth salivating. And it prevents it from sounding so dry and smacky. Okay. So, right. But beforehand, some tips to avoid that, that is just don't try not to eat right before a session, just in general. Right. Um, that's square one. But if you have to, like I did, I was starving. Um, avo- dairy is one of the biggest ones. Spicy foods. Just things where your body kind of reacts to more. Right. As opposed to, you know. Um, uh, but really, those are the main ones that... that, that um, Caffeine, like coffee, unfortunately, uh, no matter how expensive the coffee maker is, it will still dry you out if you're not heavily hydrating with water on the side. Yeah, so I've been going through uh, lots of coffee on this interview and also drinking a big glass of water. So I'm not sure if that counts or not. But no, that does. Like honestly, like if you if you have to have the coffee, right? Like I had to eat food. Um, just okay. just try try to avoid the dairy, and if it's caffeine, just try to drink a lot of water with it. Uh, Otherwise, you're gonna. Oh, I was going to say, I'd say, technically, I don't think I had to have the caffeine in the coffee. No <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Whatever you need to tell yourself, ma'am. All right. So um, very cool, man. Well, let's um, let's see. What else should we keep talking about? I mean, um, we've covered a lot of stuff. Do you want to talk more about mixing the voice with music when you make these reels and demos? I did write down a question to ask you about, you know, ducking or no ducking. What is that? Is that a tool we need to understand and use when we're doing voiceover stuff? Oh God, I'm so glad you asked this. (laughs) I'm so glad you asked this. I didn't know this was coming. So this is authentic excitement, people. Okay, great. Um, That yes, please use ducking, please. Now I'm not saying this because I'm a fragile actor and I'm like, I only need to hear my voice. I don't care about your music bed that you composed from scratch. And you know, it's, I'm not, it's not coming from a place of that. It's coming from, I'd rather, at the end of the day, whether it's in a film or it's in a tutorial video on YouTube, right? Even if you're demonstrating something on mixing and you're talking over music that is consistently playing, just I would rather myself and anyone else, just a viewer who doesn't even know audio, would rather be able to clearly hear the voice speaking to them, which is what the con- which is what they're there for, is to learn what you're saying <laughs> or hear what you're singing or, or uh, I mean, speaking. Um, the, and have it be too aggressive of ducking where it really turns it down. Cause you didn't, you just didn't do the ducking well versus no ducking at all. And then where you're like, Oh yeah, I can hear him nice and clear. And all of a sudden the music bed's like, dun, 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 right. It's like the big climax in the song. And all of a sudden, like the voice, you can't really hear anything. Like, so you, and, uh, like, right. I wasn't, that's what it sounds like. You can't, right. the voice you're like, you're struggling to listen. And if you're a content creator or a podcaster, or if you're mixing commercials that is selling a product for a brand, that is the last thing you want the listener to do is to, is to subconsciously feel uncomfortable or having to make an extra effort to consume what you are making, right? So, but it happens so much. Like there's so many projects I've, uh, um, that I hear on TV or on the radio, but it's more so like on TV and web videos where they clearly did no ducking, like well, zero ducking. And, it, and, and the boy veal gets buried. So what ducking, is it? Uh, yeah, sorry. You're like, what do I consider no. ducking? Or yeah, just... what, what is it? Explain it to the rock stars, what ducking is. Sure. No, I, I assume, yeah. Um, so ducking, at least in my, I believe the main widely known definition <laughs> is the act of um, side chain uh, compressing whatever is not VO. <laughs> So music bed and sound effects, presumably, where that gets turned down automatically or manually, doesn't really matter, but it automatic is much easier. That those get turned down when the voice is speaking. Right. Why? So you can hear the voice. You know, you hear in movie trailers. Movie trailers has the most dramatic ducking ever, right? Go play any movie trailer and specifically just only focus on the music bed and sound effects. And you'll notice how aggressive it is, but they have to do it because it's literally like, um, not only for the VO to be clear, but voiceover doesn't, there's not a lot of voiceover on uh, trailers anymore. It's mostly the actor's dialogue lines. 
And mm -hmm. that has to, so now that you're dealing with Tom Cruise, you definitely, no one's ever going to make Tom Cruise's voice get buried, right? <laughs> They're going to do everything they can to make sure that guy's voice sticks out um, because of the importance of it. So you hear like, burn, dun, 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 burn. And, then, oh, and it just like, all of a sudden it turns down like 20 dB as Tom says his line. And as he finishes his line, it turns back up. So that's there for a reason. Um, so it, anyways, so that's, that's what ducking is uh, on, on a basic level. Well, and it lets them crank the music way up too. It's sort of like the reverse effect. It's kind of like compression. Compression is turning things way down so you can turn them way up. <laughs> Yeah. Ducking is kind of like turning the music way down when there's dialogue so that you can turn it up when there's not dialogue. Exactly. Exactly. And there are so many ways you can do it. Um, luckily, I've been seeing more and more like video to like Adobe Premiere uh, Pro for video editors, like uh, and, and other ba like base, even like you know, uh, mobile apps. They have built in ducking features now. You know, it's because funny, there's so many. In, yeah, go ahead. In in Mac, iMovie has a ducking feature, but I but it's not in Final Cut Pro. <laughs> I don't understand <laughs> why. I haven't seen that. There you go. Typical Apple, right? Yeah, and so Rockstars, that's why my YouTube videos are an example of, you know, Jordan saying, make it so you can hear the voice. Uh if you if no one's complained, then <laughs> um, you're doing Again, you can still get away with no ducking as long as it's just balanced enough. But most songs have dynamics in them, right? Right. Like they build up. But if you just get a straight, flat, you know, typical corporate sounding music bed, they intentionally are written to not have too many dynamics. Right. Another so, thing interesting about music beds to go with voice is it's more useful to have a music bed that's very wide stereo with nothing in the middle. Yeah. I think. Well, and you can, mm -hmm. that's right. a trick you can do too. You can, you can use like a, um, an easy, simple way is like using the Waves Center plugin, where you just put it on the music bed and you just start pulling out the bottom. As I'm long, sorry, the, the, the middle. Oh, right. As long as it's a stereo music bed. If it's a mono music bed, correct. You try the Widener thing and nothing happens, and you're like, I don't know, is this working? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's a simple way, but I I've experimented with that and I don't do it. Um, I tried it a few times and I just it just it wasn't have I I my goal is to get. The goal is to have the VO front and center, but commercials, we're talking commercials and spe specifically here, especially TV commercials, like everything's pretty loud and hot, like every, you know, but everything's clear when it's mixed well. Mm -hmm. um, and my goal is to get it to sound as authentic and just like a real commercial as possible in the, in the reel itself. So, but I, I, I dial it back a little bit more than I would if I was making a real commercial because the purpose of the demo reel is to showcase the talent and their abilities. And I don't want anything to be at all distracting, uh, too distracting away from the voice because yeah. they're trying to sell themselves, right? They're not trying to sell Mc, a McDonald's McRap, you know, coffee McCafe cream. That's a, that's now available at McDonald's, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, but don't you know, have it just before you do your voice. Don't have it before a podcast like I did today or voiceover. Um, but... So I, 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 I pull it back like 20% of what a lot of real commercials would do as far as how hot the music and sound effects would get because I, you need the talent to shine. Yeah. Uh, well, all right. So let, let's, let's break down the ducking just a little bit more. So let's say um, somebody's got a single voice and a stereo audio track. What, just for the most basic way, what do they set up to create a ducking effect of, to make the music go away when the voice is talking? If you don't already have a built-in ducking tool, like I think even ScreenFlow has it now, you know, because I'm sure I don't know what your is your primary audience just like home studio and pro studio. Yeah, engineers, yeah, and right? primarily everybody's using Pro Tools. Okay, all right, cool. Which of course I am not familiar with, but <laughs> that's all right. But um, but I mean, everybody's using Logic and Studio One as well. Maybe describe how you do it in Studio One. Yeah, and I, this the same would apply in Pro Tools. I was just wondering if people were like content creators because there's ScreenFlow and Adobe Premiere. Those actually already have that. That's they have the easiest way to do it. It's literally like duck, and then here here's my music track, here's my VO track, duck, and then you can slide make a, fit, a, a slider of how much ducking occurs. It's brilliant. Right. Um, but if if you're not in those applications, if you're mostly in Pro Tools or just a DAW, um, just grab the. But you don't need any colory fancy compressor. Just grab the the built-in compressor which presumably has a uh, sidechain input feature. Not all compressors do. Mm -hmm. 
and you put that on the music bed itself. And then you uh, take the VO track and you make a send and you send it to the input of that compressor sitting on the music bed. Input of the side chain of the compressor. The side chain of the compressor. Yes, thank you. Um, and as far as my settings go on commercial, you, then you got to tweak, okay, what are, how much am I compressing? What are my, um, you know, release times and, and, and whatnot. And I keep them very gentle. So if there's a, if there's a knee feature on the compressor, make it really soft, but not too soft where mm. it takes too long to duck. And then you kind of hear it, um, going in, but, uh, crap, what is my, and then release is sort of like whatever just sort of sounds smooth. natural. Mm -hmm. And I release sometimes up to 400 milliseconds. Which is long, right? It's long, yeah. But I don't want it... It depends on how much the VO is talking. Sometimes there's longer breaks between their phrases because it's a more dramatic read. Or sometimes it's just wall-to-wall -wall them speaking. So the release time isn't as important. Mm -hmm. You just got to make sure it's not too short to where you hear... Ugh, ugh. You know, you don't want it to... If, if you're doing something and you want to be really clean and consistent, I've automated um, either the send to that side chain so to prevent how aggressive it gets on certain ends of phrases, or I'm automating the release on the compressor. Interesting. Fascinating, man. Let's see, this is very cool. And, um, you know, in the music world, a 400 millisecond release time would, would typically be very, very long. Like, it's probably yeah. even longer than, uh, uh, you know, that's maybe like, you know, Ringo, when he when he does the crash and the kick and then the, the cymbal slowly <laughs> swells up, you know? Yeah, yeah. But um, but in voiceover, yeah, you don't want to hear the music rush in between every phrase, every word. You might want to hear it rush in when there's a pause or a break in between lyric, uh, words, not lyrics. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. It's it's really it's it's difficult on some on some spots because you can't control like you, you should never like move where your VO comes in and out as far as the phrasing, like the timing of their lines how you edit it based on how your compressor is reacting. But sometimes you want to, because you're like, ah, the music keeps kicking in all weird after they say that one sentence, because there's a longer gap there. And But just go either automate the send to it, automate the release time. So what, I, what I'll, I'll typically do is I'll make the release time like maybe up to 600 on that one section, right? Yeah, yeah. And then bring it back down to 400 when the VO kicks back in. Yeah, that seems like that would do it. I almost, I can picture it in my head. Now you need to, a VO ducking compressor that when it compresses down, there's a freeze button. So you can just write freeze and just keep it down and out of the way <laughs> until you like unfreeze it. And then it and yeah. then it comes back up or something. Yeah. Like almost like a freeze threshold or something. Yeah. yeah. Cool, yeah. man. Um, what, what other good mixing tricks? Uh, how do we make the whole thing sound loud and exciting? And how loud is loud enough? Is there such thing as too loud? <laughs> In in what in demo reel sense? Yeah, or just like, like this whole this whole glued mix of the voice and the music together. And again, rock stars, if you're trying to picture what we're talking about, um, you know, the YouTube playlist of Jordan's work gives you the, all these samples of like voiceover music, you know, and doing these different, um, you know, like different ads or different voiceover stuff. But but like I guess each thing is different. Like a commercial might be really like in your face. And where you're mixing voice and music that's meant to be part of a um, a video game, it might be more subtle and chill. Yeah, no, you're, abs you're, you're absolutely right. Um, it depends on the genre, but for simplicity's sake, um, let's stick with commercial, right? Yeah, let's do the, now, hard, the hard stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, a, dem a demo reels, re remember what the purpose is here is to get, is to get buyers to listen to it, enjoy it, Get, be able to clearly hear you in your performances, but also have it sound very professional, clean, polished, um, great audio quality, modern music beds, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, but at the end of the day, they aren't, they aren't, it's so different from music in the fact that you don't need to like, like dynamic range, you, you we tend to push it as demo producers, make it hotter, like almost as if it were, you know, what was that Metallica record? Um, right. Oh, uh, Mag uh, Death Magnetic. Yeah, yeah. Like, not that hot. Some, some, some demo producers mix it that a uh, mass mix and master it that hot. And in my opinion, that just kills the. It just it's it's too radio y, right? It sounds too much like old school radio right. production style. So, 
I, I am on the hotter side, but I, I, I don't, I try to find that balance to where, why do I push it hotter? Because people like casting um, directors and agents and people who are hiring voice talent, most of them are listening on, you know, their MacBook Air speakers, which don't right. get loud, or their speaker on their iPhone 6, right? <laughs> nice. Right, which is a smaller speaker than the iPhone 8, right? I'm just giving scenarios where uh, people are most often playing your work to determine if they want to hire you or have you audition for a project. And because of that, they, you know, uh, I, I do make it hotter than I would if it were like a film, right? Or a, definitely a song, uh, depending on the genre. So it's on the hotter side. I, I love um, isotope um, ozone. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use, I, I use kind of the bare bones of it. I'm using like the multiband compressor on it and the limiter. Right. Um, really fine tuned because it's really easy to get it to sound too slappy, too aggressive, too, um, it's taking me a long time to kind of get, dial in how much, I, I, I air more on the, the peaks kind of, I split the difference between the peaks getting s slammed. Like there's like a transparent and then there's like a, I can't remember, harsh mode or something on mm -hmm. the, the limiter in there. And I'm right, I'm kind of right in between there. Every demo is varies, but I kind of tend to ride in the, the sweet spot in between there. Because if it's too transparent, then you hear it catching up and slamming it all down. Right. Is there, versus, is there a, a meter somewhere that you read and, and refer to sometimes to go like, if it's hotter than this, it's too much. And if it's below this, it's not going to be loud enough? Um, no, it's, here's the thing is like, it's, the spots are so different. See, a song kind of has like a consistent, you know, build, right? Mm -hmm. You have the verse and the, the core, you know, some elements it's going to get, it's going to breathe here and there, but you kind of have a similar sonic spectrum happening. Most of the song with a demo, it's literally like seven second to 15 second long spots in one minute total. One will be like, it could be someone literally just, uh, walking down a hallway and talking to themselves. So it's just a room ambient noise and Foley. And then the next spot that comes in is like a heavy classic rock track for a Chili's commercial, right? Right. With like sizzling burger sound effects and a big slam boom that comes on when the logo shows up. So it's really difficult to have like, oh yeah, the whole, like it should always be riding around this loudness level, right? So I tend to try to average it out at the end. Uh, Studio One has a cool loudness detection um, feature in their mastering section. Mm-hmm. And you can just run it. It does, it does a quick analyzer and it gives you a, a dynamic range reference. And um, I tend to try to go around like 11 to 12. Uh, okay, cool. Is the dynamic range. Anything hotter than that, it's like, it's just getting pretty squashed. Um, and it varies per genre. Video games, animation, it's going to be wider, you know? Right. It's more like uh, watching the soundtrack to a movie in the middle of a movie. I, I, I guess I learned that early on, like, the first time I got involved in trying to mix audio for um, to to accompany a film, you know, here I am trying to take all this stuff I was doing. Like I'm just trying to make everything as loud as it can go, you know. And, yep. and and we did it, and and I can't remember what it was. I think the producer took it and played it at first, you know, in a theater or something, and it just about blew up the speakers. <laughs> and I was oh, like, shit. It's like, oh man, I'm so sorry. I didn't know, you know. <laughs> and then like, and so then we had to pull it all the way back down. But, um, well, that's cool, man. That's cool. I, I like hearing all this stuff. Um, uh, any other thoughts about, so, so ozone on the kind of mix bus when you're doing this stuff, any other tips for, um, just mixing and, and getting a good, cool sound for this stuff? Man, it's just, let me just put it this way. It's like, you just got to do it right. The more time you spend doing it, like every demo I, I mix, I get better. Like I, I either try, I discover something in a plugin that I didn't realize I had, or I just notice your ears just get better and better and better the more you are using that part of your mind to really listen and be critical, right? On, okay, this is kind of, it's like if it's someone's home studio and it's not your favorite sound, but it's still professional, like it's not crap, but it's not, how you would prefer it to sound. It's like, okay, here's a new challenge, right? I got to figure out like, okay, well, I usually, what I usually do is cut out some low end here. And whatever. So I try to challenge myself to not always just do what I usually do. Right. Right. 
it's not like I rewrite the book every time, right? Because then I, I wouldn't make any money because it would just, it would take way too much time. But um, I have like my go-to, you know, templates and presets, but um, I'm mix and matching different plugins and compressors and EQs. It's, it's a very touchy feely process. So I just encourage those, especially people who work in like any, any sort of production deadlines when it comes to like video or entertainment, it's fast. It's like really fast stuff. But if you have the luxury to spend more time on it, do it enough to where you can feel like it's not just another thing you got to get out the door. Use it as an opportunity to, you know what? I, I bought that Waves plugin on sale like a year ago. <laughs> Maybe I should try it for once, right? Yeah, and I use know. it and, and then play around with it, right? Um, or you're like, you know, I usually use this de but I wonder what the stock de sounds like. I'm going to try that. You know, and it's like maybe an extra 15, 20 minutes in that project that you're working on it. But it's empowering and it also reminds you of like why you're doing it because you love it. And it's 15 or 20 minutes for you this time. Like you've already done what you needed to do. Now you're just honing your your mix craft a little. Yeah, exactly. And so, I don't know, that's not like a super major specific tip, but it's more of kind of a, a guideline to go by. And, yeah. and you, you'll notice you'll improve. Like go listen to your old mix. You're like, whoa. You know, spend time reminiscing in your old stuff. When I pull up just my old, my old voiceover performance, it's like my auditions from just like three years ago. I'm like, I don't know how anyone paid me money to do this. <laughs> I was terrible. Um, Sometimes so, I yeah. pull up my old mixes and I'm like, man, that sounded great. What did I do? I forgot. Why did I change yeah. it all? <laughs> I've had that too, you know, because I've, I've mixed some music, right? You know, for, for a few dozen projects. And yeah, I'm like, I haven't done music mixing in a while, like years now. So I'll go listen. I'm like, man, that's actually pretty good. I don't know if I could, I don't think I could replicate that right now because I'm not actively doing it. That's right? great. All right. So I got one more question for you and then we'll sort of close out here. Um, got it. What is ADR and how should we yeah. set up a session for that? That's part of what you do as well, right? I don't. Okay. I, I, as a voice talent, I do ADR, but I don't engineer ADR sessions. But okay. I can provide some insight because I am an engineer and I have friends who are, are ADR engineers specifically. So they'd be what able to answer it? it like way better. <laughs> ADR stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement or Automation. Wait, yeah, uh, it's automatic automated or automatic. or automatic, right? That's the same thing, right? Um, and what, it, what it's used for, um, the most known form is in film where... Uh, for people who, you know, film on location and stuff know the conditions can be terrible, right? If, if there's all these external noises and you're like in Manhattan and they're running down the street and there's buses driving by and they're like, we got to get the coffee, you know, oh, it's going to be late. We get there before it closes, whatever, right? That they're going to have recorded audio, but it's going to sound like shit and it's unusable for the movie. So what they do is they either hire the celebrity to come into a studio, into a large sound booth, you know, um, with a typically a, a boom shotgun mic a Sennheiser 416, which I'm using right now, is pretty common, I believe. Or they try to match the same boom mic they used on set in the studio. And they'll pull up those scenes on a video for the celebrity. Or it's very common for a voice actor like myself. I've gone in and replaced the voice of that celebrity, imitating them. That's, you know, those were the examples of voice matching that was on your website. Correct. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's a specialty of mine. And um, but it's essentially it's it's still the same thing. It's all ADR. But, but to engineer it, you you uh, uh, as far as the process goes, the mic they they kind of it's not as close as it would be for like a commercial session. Most of the time, it's up further, as if it was like uh, out in the field, right? Probably a few feet right, from the the right. talent is what I've seen most of the time. And then um, you have three beeps that you play in the voice talent's head or on speakers. And then there's no sound in the booth anymore after those beeps. Where on the imaginary fourth beat, beep, <laughs> the voice talent then says their line, which is written on a script. So it goes like boop, boop, boop. And then right when that fourth beat starts, you say the first consonant of your word in your script. Okay, and that just helps it land. So, so now this is in sync with the film usually, or correct, or or, or the animation, right? Like I do, I do anime. Mm -hmm. which is all originally in Japanese. So the lip flaps on the animated characters was designed around the Japanese voice actors. 
So then really talented <laughs> copywriters and translators write it for English, an English version, which still makes sense, but still the amount of syllables matches the exact amount of times that mouth opens and closes for an English voice actor like myself to go in. And then we do it line by line. You know, I might do like two, three full lines max in one take. But then after that, it's a very technical process. And it's very difficult to get, you know, to have a natural performance when it's so unnatural feeling. That's so funny. Um, so, so I love the lip flaps, like we have a new terminology yeah. here. But you're, <laughs> you have to phrase the English words to match what the mouth is doing in Japanese. Yeah, but that's more of the job of the copywriter. Because as the talent, your job is to just read the script as is and perform it. And they've already timed and practiced it as non-actors, but they just, they know how many flaps and to match to the syllables. And the vo so I, I rarely have to watch the screen when I go in and perform. I just listen for the beeps, speak, and, and, and you know, at, at, a, at a moderate pace. You always hear the original reference track too, by the way. You hear how long they took to finish that sentence in Japanese mm -hmm. or what the celebrity did. And so you have a timing in your head. You're like, hey, that felt like about 3.8 seconds. <laughs> As a voice talent, you get really good with timing. Interesting. And you, and you hear it. And then once that fourth beep comes on, you go for that line in your language or matching the celebrity and, and finishing that line in the same amount of time they took. Now, but, do you know 15 seconds and 30 seconds like in your sleep? At this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and especially people who come from radio, right? I don't come from radio, but like, like my girlfriend does. And she, I mean, we're in session. Like I had a session this morning. They're like, hey, can you, um, it's a little, uh, uh, it's a little too long. We wrote too much copy. It's supposed to come in around like what you just read came in around 58.5. We're really aiming for like 56. Can you do it? I'm like, I'll give it a try. Right. And most of the time, because I've been doing it for so long and I've done thousands of commercials, I usually nail it or I'm really close. So I'll get it like at 55.8 or 56.7, which is within the range that they wanted so they could fit in sound effects and other things. That's so yeah, that's fascinating. In order for me to get it down, I just edit out all my breaths. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, but then that sounds weird, right? It's like, whoa, he's like, is he yeah. going to pass out? Yeah. I may have a couple of weird sounding ones out there. Um, so then, um, any, any, uh, Fun stories about doing celebrity dialogue replacement. Anybody want to, anything you can tell? It's all, it's all <laughs> secretive, right? Dude, yes. That's what's so frustrating about our business is like, especially in video games and film stuff, like you go in and you work on these things and you can't, you sign really big non-disclosure agreements, like scary ones <laughs> where they're like, we'll take your firstborn. I mean, not. It doesn't say that literally, but damn near, right? It, because they want to protect their their content. I get it. And oh, um, funny, yeah. so um, the, I, I've done really big celebrity, very funny celebrity, um, a bunch of TV trailers and another cool project where his voice is going to be used on for a character that he does in a movie coming out. I can't share it until it comes out next month. But um, all, right, all right, we'll wait. We'll I, wait I wanted, patiently. Yeah. I, yeah. So that, think, that one's really, I'm really looking forward to sharing that. I think through the power of deduction, though, we can figure out the, uh, the two celebrities whose voices you haven't replaced before, which are John <laughs> Lennon and Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. I need to work on those. All right, man. But, Dude, it's such a pleasure to have you here on Recording Studio Rockstars. I have one last clo closing question. This one is hypothetical. We're going to take the way back voiceover studio machine and you're going right. to go back in time, find young Jordan and say, I don't know what voice you're going to use. Hey, Jordan, <laughs> here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the voiceover recording one day. What, what advice is, would you go back yeah. and give yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely have developed a Southern accent. That was a great impression <laughs> of me, man. Thanks. I've hey, been Jordan. I've, I've been working on it for a real long time. <laughs> this is what happens when you live in Nashville for uh, I know. 30 years. I was going to say, you actually don't have much of an accent for living in Nashville. Um, uh, yeah, I'd be like, hey, Jordan, so uh, you're, you're 21. Um, you I go. won't do that the whole time. So, yeah, uh, my, my young self getting into VO, um, I would say, hey, just to bullet point a few things. It's not about your voice. It's about acting. So don't spend so much time thinking you can do it and actually get trained <laughs> on how to do it on nice. the audio side of things. Um, less is more, you know, don't go 
downloading illegally downloading every like the waves you know mercury bundle on BitTorrent when and and think you're everything is going to sound 10 times better because you now have it because it didn't right like that's that's yeah. how i started this was before i was getting paid or anything i was playing around and i shouldn't have done it but we've all done it i think everybody's done it yeah it's like when you're first getting started you just want it all because you want to be good right but it's all about the long game right? You're never going to just knock it out of the park right when you start. You got to do more instead of, you can learn, but learn more by doing as opposed to watching and listening. Well, the other thing that happens, you know, as a youngster downloading a a cracked plugin is (laughs) one day you actually meet somebody who makes the plugin (laughs) and you're like, Uh oh, you're just like me and trying really hard to, uh, to, to do this right, you know? So, yeah. That's pretty um, um, enlightening, and it, it'll change your attitude quickly. <laughs> no, essentially, what my rule was uh, it was because um, I, li- you know, I wasn't making a dime. Like I was, it was all for play. And again, that doesn't excuse it at all. <laughs> like, but that's what I, that's what I told myself. And um, and frankly, most of them didn't even work and whatnot. But of the ones that work, I was like, once I start making money, then I'm gonna buy. And, and I, I did it. I did it before I even started making money. Cause I just felt too bad because the, 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 the plugins were so good and they helped me so much, um, learn, right. Yeah. That I, I like to, you know, so I buy them on sale and support them and you're right. And then you go to conferences like audio conferences and stuff. And then you, you meet these great people who, you know, trying to make a living with just like you are. So yeah. Exactly. Don't buy it. Don't do crack software. Folks. Exactly. So that, that's what I would tell my young self. <laughs> um, very cool, man. Well, dude, thanks so much for uh, joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. What a pleasure to, to meet you and to just hear all these great stories and to just get into this, you know, really brand new topic. Uh, for yeah, me dude, I, I hope it's interesting, man. <laughs> it's very specific. It is. But... It's very cool stuff. And, and again, um, Rockstars, I encourage you to consider the fact that you are very attentive to audio to just like open up your understanding of what's possible as far as stuff that you can get into recording that's you know also beyond music is you know doing voice recording is it's some it's cool stuff and it's really rewarding and it's a lot of fun to do oh there do all audio engineers out there looking to make a buck on anything that they can with their skills huge market in in voice production like podcasts alone but like ads and bumpers on podcasts um, Alexa, you know, Amazon Alexa skill sets, skill sets. There's all these things that voice is going into where they need good quality, like meditation apps. Think of how many apps right. that have voices that talk to you now, right? Like they're filled with mouth clicks like I am today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll make, we'll make sure Liz takes care of that. Um, <laughs> I got a plug in for that. Yeah, exactly. He's got the isotope going. And I but, paid uh, for it. That's good. That's, I'm glad you could share that with me. Yeah. You're so honest. You're welcome. Like, um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so how can the rock stars find you online? How can they, they follow you, learn more about what you do? Um, you know, go hear you speak at a conference, all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> uh, thanks, man. Well, the easiest way is just jordanreynolds.com. That's with Jordan with an A, like Michael Jordan. <laughs> Just can't jump as high as him, unfortunately. I tried. Uh, Jordan Reynolds, R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S. And I have all my social media links on there. But I think if you just Google my name, I believe I'm usually <laughs> the, the more, the more well-known Jordan Reynolds. But nice. I think there's an up-and-coming like basketball player in college or something who's getting more, <laughs> like, more well-known. I don't know. But I'm pretty easy to find online. Instagram, I'm most active on. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. All right, cool, man. Well, thanks again for being here with us. Um, if you have any closing words for the rock stars, um, now's the time to say it. Otherwise, I, I look forward to meeting you in person. And um, who knows, maybe we'll be doing some kind of a, well, we won't, I don't know if we'll do a record together, but we might do a record of the human voice at some point. Dude, we'll do the first album that's all spoken word. Nice. Yeah. Awesome, in man. The world. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, dude. And I uh, look forward to seeing you around the studio. Thank you so much, man. It's been an honor. I really, this has been a blast. Thank you. Awesome. Cheers, man. Cheers. 
Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.